I got, you know, I got a lot of feedback from the first debate. Most of it was relatively positive. Um, but the one consistent piece of advice was that I need to be more aggressive. Um, so if you, if you will, uh, you just, can you give me a second? I just want to yell at you, uh, for maybe 20 seconds to, yeah, to give the it. people what they want. Hit me up. Okay. 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 I've been working on this. <sighs> okay. Okay. A little nervous. Okay. Bosh, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Okay. That was one. Mm -hmm. I've got two more. Okay. Uh, you're so fucking stupid that if you were born in the 1930s, you would have been lobotomized by your parents. All right, that was the second one. It's good. It's good. Um, okay, and I've got the third. The third one's okay. Just don't get triggered by the third one, okay? Okay. The third one. You sir, are not very good at Metroid. Uh we were uh, we were doing some some research then before the uh, yeah. the conversation. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. I I, I did. You know, I posted to your um, I posted to your subreddit uh, about the debate coming up this one today, and someone said that I can't possibly win because of my rampant idealism, mm -hmm. and so I should debate you dialectically, materially, uh, to to stand a chance. Uh, what do you think of that advice? I think that uh, that would be an unwinnable position from your end because the economy is not real in a dialectically materialist sense. Um, it's an idea. Okay. So it's pretty much, it's pr pretty much uh, mm. just uh, over and done with right out the gate. Economics itself is idealism. Mm -hmm. I, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but all right, well, uh, yeah, okay. So I guess if you, if you want to go ahead and get started, I've got questions. I've got a little, I've got a little frame for way for for how this can go. Um, if if you want to, if you want to start there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with regards to worker cooperatives, of which I seem to be one of the more vocal advocates online, uh, I think that it would be good if we not only changed uh, existing laws in order to either subsidize or incentivize the creation of new worker cooperatives. And there are a number of ways in which you can do this, from tax incentives to preferential loans to a, a tremendous number of ways you can approach that. Um, and I think that uh, more research should be done in that particular field uh, because my, my dream would be a worker cooperative economy, one in which private ownership of any company is illegal, at least past a certain size. Uh, if you have one or two people doing a startup, it seems a little unwieldy to have a government mandated uh, democratic threshold that you have to meet. Uh, that seems like it'd be very difficult to legislate. But past a certain size, I think it's reasonable to aim for the goal of a completely cooperative economy. Um, economically, I think that it's difficult to make a full case for the effectiveness of this because we just have so little data. We know that worker cooperatives are effective in many respects at a small level, um, though in some fields they, in terms of economics, perform equally well to traditionally run firms. In some they seem to exceed in some margins. Workers seem to be a bit happier. In larger firms, I mean I'm talking like transnational corporations, um, I'd be interested in seeing how a worker cooperative model could be applied to that. I imagine this project, this experiment, could take a very long time. Um, as it should, because it's important to gather good data on that sort of thing. Uh, and to finish, the truth is, though, I talk about economic productivity, but the reality of this is that I really don't give a shit whether or not worker cooperatives are more effective or efficient than uh, traditionally run firms. In fact, they could be less effective um, than traditionally run firms, and I would still advocate for them for political reasons, if not economic reasons. For the same reason that even if you presented me data proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that an authoritarian government is more effective at quick decision making than a democratic government, I would still favor democracy in any situation because I think the ability to control the systems in which you live is just a fundamental um, right humans should have access to. Okay. And so you've, you've kind of answered some of the questions that I figured uh, I would start out with. So market socialism, I guess to you is basically a cooperative, you know, worker cooperatives, essentially. Like if you, well, not that that's the only way that market wor worker, or not so that that's the only way that market socialism could come into being, but basically your version of market socialism is, you know, when 95% of businesses are worker cooperatives, it sounds like. 
Yeah, ideally. I, I think that there are a number of ways to approach it, but the abolition of the bourgeois is, is a necessary prerequisite. That's one effective way of doing it. Okay, and that makes some sense. And you feel like even if the data could show you that worker cooperatives are uh, demonstrably sort of worse than traditional firms, you would still advocate for them because principally you think that basically worker democracy is is kind of an a priori issue yes if they were so much worse i mean so categorically ineffective um that it, it, it trying to implement that model would lead to like civilizational collapse or would reduce the standard of living so drastically that you would actually get more benefits from authoritarianism across the board you know if democracy truly could not function then I would be willing to consider, uh, you know, compromises in that respect. But thankfully, the data doesn't seem to indicate that worker cooperatives are anywhere near that ineffective. Um, or at least we'd need more data to find out if they are. Yeah. Um, so I think that in general, my position on this would be that I think incentives are good. Um, I don't know of anybody who's sort of inherent. I don't know of anybody who has some sort of intrinsic opposition to worker cooperatives, to be fair. Um, I mean, even like, a, I don't see even why like a conservative would have a problem with people voluntarily forming a worker cooperative, unless they have, unless they're just kind of weird. Um, and I think most people could also get on board with incentives. I think that, however, two things with regard to incentives and then with regard to the future economy where you're sort of mandated to be cooperatives. Um, mm -hmm. I think that with regard to incentives, I don't actually think they would be that effective at transforming the economy to be um, even close to entirely worker cooperatives. I don't think that would be enough. A mandate would get you there, but I think that a mandate has so many structural problems that um, I could I, I, I could conceive of a society where a worker cooperatively sort of mandated economy is actually a fair bit worse than our current economy. And uh, the third thing that I would say is that uh, what I what I would say from a from sort of a more capitalist or social democratic perspective is that um, democracy in the workplace isn't even necessarily a bad idea. I mean, the idea of a collaborative sort of uh, more committee oriented workplace uh, is fine, uh, but I think there's actually better ways to implement democratic structures in the workplace than necessarily some sort of cooperative mandate. Um, and I think there's good ways to implement those things that are alternative to uh, or in addition to. Uh, worker cooperative incentives that I think would be advantageous uh, and ultimately better than some sort of a, you know, a, a more strict uh, mandated system. Better to what end? Well, I mean, better to the end of uh, economic growth is one thing, right? Better for economic growth. I think also ultimately better for the workers as well, right? I mean, I, I, obviously, I think you would agree that, you know, there's, there's a lot of workers who, uh, maybe wouldn't necessarily want to be uh, the owners of their business, right? There's there's risks associated with being a worker, sure, but there's additional sort of uh, unique risks that are associated with being the owner of a business. Um, and that's not to mention that, you know, forget about the sort of, you know, uh, well, it, it really comes back to the investment risk is one thing, sure. But, um, you know, the, the, there's the sort of employment risk as an owner. That's one thing, sure. Um, but that, that same risk sort of applies with a, uh, a worker as well. But there's sort of credit and financial risks that don't exist for, uh, you know, workers that exist for owners. And I think that when you make a worker uh, necessarily be invested uh, several hundred thousand dollars into one single business, I mean, that's just, you know, that, that sort of flies in the face of relatively standard financial advice, right? Which is like, you don't want to invest like almost all your net worth into a single business. And I think that in a worker cooperative sort of mandated economy, you're requiring workers to do that and you know they simply might just not want to right i think that would be fine that would be a fine choice for them to make especially under my framework which is uh more flexible but also includes a lot of sort of protections for workers that i think are fairly robust i don't know what additional risk there would be in a worker cooperative economy if you want to join with a place and you pass some minimal probationary period and you become a member i don't know why you would need to rely on an investment of hundreds of thousands of dollars to do so the same amount of money is there presently, conceptually, in an economy which is democratically owned or traditionally owned. Um, I don't know why you would need to incur any more of a risk as an owner. As a worker, we know that um, there are plenty of perils you face in the job market. The, jo the possibility of losing your job suddenly, uh, which can happen essentially at any time with no severance um, in the States, at least in, in, in a great many fields, um, fired without cause. Um, 
you can travel for a job that gives way underneath your feet very quickly. I just, I don't know what additional risk you would incur. And I don't think it's something workers should have a choice to. I don't think they should have the freedom to not be free. We don't give people, after all, the opportunity to sell their ability to vote in federal elections, right? If we did, we could imagine that would be quite destructive. I bet many people would if they could. If you could offer a person $10,000 and they could never vote again, but instead, like, uh, the person who bought the vote from them could vote in their stead. You can imagine situations where, you know, conglomerates would buy up thousands or millions of votes to sway local and federal elections massively. I think there were significant consequences to allowing people um, the ability to opt out of democracy, even if it's something they don't want necessarily. Well, I think the issue is that, you know, we can have democracy in the workplace, but um, I think that when you tie democracy and democratic structures to ownership, that's when you run into economic problems, right? So, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, why, why would you need a huge investment in the business? Well, if you're going to, obviously, if you're going to own a business, right, you have to buy equity in that business. Um, and I think that under a lot of socialist type frameworks, I think that ownership without equity seems, uh, well, it seems like a, you know, an oxymoron almost, right? You, you, you do have to invest some sort of capital into the business. Otherwise, you know, what would, what would starting businesses look like? What would, what would selling businesses look like? Um, would that even be possible? I'm not sure, honestly. But um, in general, though, if, if we assume that uh, if we assume that a market socialist society can maintain to at least some, some uh, reasonable degree the wealth of today's society, uh, then it would necessarily be the case that workers would be heavily invested in the businesses that they work in. You might say that that's a good thing. All that I would say is that's a structural barrier for a lot of people. Um, and I think that also that's a reasonable choice that people might not want to make. It's not that people wouldn't necessarily be listened to under my system. I think worker board membership is a great policy. I think unionization is a great policy. Um, I think a robust welfare state is a great policy. I think in a system where you have a robust welfare state, pretty you know ubiquitous unionization and uh, mandatory worker uh, board membership, sort of that democratic you know you know democracy in the workplace, basically. Um, I don't really see why it's necessarily the case that we would have to make all businesses cooperatives, unless, uh, of course, we're just sort of tied to that idea of socialism. You know, my system might not be considered socialist, whereas yours would be, but I, you know, I'm not sure that that's a system that's necessarily better for the workers. I am tied to that idea. Uh, if we're limiting our discussion exclusively to what looks better on a GDP chart, then we would continue with neoliberalism until the planet burned. But there are broader considerations. You know, nobody, like, smashed graphs together to figure out whether or not it was worthwhile to give people the vote. Uh, it's something you fight for as a matter of principle. And I do think there are direct downstream consequences of the economic authoritarianism we live under now. First of all, I just don't think there's any additional risk. Worker cooperatives already exist. You don't need to buy into them. It's a system in some countries. I think in France, for example, it's fairly normalized that there's a, a buy-in to, uh, to a worker cooperative, but that's by no uh, means necessary. In either case, capital acquisition is difficult for forming worker cooperatives, but that's primarily because we live in a system where the primary means of investment for larger corporations is through the stock market, which confers, of course, not just, uh, you know, investment, but ownership and control. Um, you know, that's a choice we make. The stock market doesn't have to be that way, you know. Uh, investment in a company, worker cooperatives, can be non-controlling. Shares can just be an investment that you receive returns from if your investment is sound. Um, a lot of the issues we have with worker cooperatives and the funding they can accrue right now is just that we've so normalized the process of selling out the democratic right of the workers at a firm that the idea of investing without getting that additional bonus is unattractive to potential investors. But that's essentially like saying, you know, we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't have like workers' rights because, you know, countries without workers' rights are more fruitful to investment because they have to pay lower wages and don't worry about OSHA, you know. Just because we, we've built a system right now where you can get away with uh, stuff that I find reprehensible. We've set the bar low. But conceptually, all of these processes of investment um, can take place in a system where there is not a single private capital owner, where everyone simply owns a portion of the workplace uh, that they participate at, or at the very least democratically controls. You know, you can work out the, um, 
the difference between like controlling shares versus just like internal democratic management but either way what i care about principally i think is the, is the democratic management you know if workers are still getting their wages but they have the ability to vote internally that would satisfy my criteria for a worker cooperative okay i mean well if that's the case though i think i could relatively i mean i think that convincingly you would just agree with my system right i mean so you you, you mentioned that you know, no one, no one did an economic analysis when it turned when it came to expanding the right to vote. Um, and I agree, of course, but I, you know, we're not. I, I'm not sure the right to vote necessarily is. Uh, I'm not. I'm not really sure how much of an economic issue that is. I, I think that when we're talking about business ownership, though, uh, naturally, this is. You know, this is more of a of, a, of an economic issue. Um, now, we might say that you know the the consequences of giving more people of enfranchising more people might have economic consequences because they might vote for certain economic policies. But I feel like there is probably a meaningful difference there. Um, that's kind of beside the point, though. I'm not I'm not really interested in that analogy. It's more so that um, you you mentioned that you know I, I just don't think that there's additional risk, right? You you mentioned France, right, where people buy essentially equity in their businesses. They're not cooperatives, to be fair. Those are those are stock ownership plans. A lot of businesses have stock ownership plans for employees. I think, um, I want to say that, I think I read a, a stat somewhere that was like 7 to 10% of all U.S. stock is owned by, you know, basically employees that, you know, just buy stock of, of, the, of the companies they live in or the companies they work at. Um, so that already, that already kind of exists in our system. Um, but those aren't worker cooperatives. I think that when you, when you talk about uh, the primary means of investment being the stock market, that's true and it's not true. I mean, like, you know, the, the business equity is, is not, it's, 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 it's kind of a, you, you know, it's, I'm not sure how old it is as a concept, but you say, I don't see what's so wrong about people owning a part of their business. I don't necessarily see a problem with that either. I just think that, that it should be voluntary or it should be encouraged. I'm not sure it should be required. This is where you run into these structural issues. You talk about the risk, right? Obviously it's risky when you're parking a bunch of, uh, a bunch of money, a bunch of your investment into one single asset being the ownership in a business, right? So for instance, but how is that obviously happening? there's how it, is what happening if you're a worker and you turn 18 and you want to go get a job how does an all worker cooperative economy mean that your involvement in the workplace is going to entail more risk because when you take a job at a worker cooperative you're you're becoming a member of that cooperative you're a part owner of that cooperative um now that ownership can either require buy-in or some sort of external you know sourcing some people talk about government grants or cooperative banking or something to give people the capital in order to buy into worker cooperatives or consumer cooperatives. You're not talking about consumer cooperatives, to be fair. And that's perfectly reasonable. But uh, nonetheless, though, all of that investment, all of that wealth of a worker is now necessarily tied into a single business within a single industry. That's a lot more risky than like a diversified portfolio. This is why there's, uh, you know, the, the I would say, you know, this is why there's a wing of socialists that don't necessarily advocate for worker ownership. And it's more about um, social wealth funds and stuff like that, because at least an advantage of social wealth fund socialism is that the uh, investments in the means of production are diversified across an entire population instead of a single business. You can see how a single business investment would be a lot more risky than like a broad market index. But you don't need to invest in anything. You don't need to buy in. We have co-ops. You can just join them. Well, we, we have, um, as, as far as I'm aware, every cooperative kind of does it differently. Um, and I'm not really sure about the cooperatives of the world, um, to be fair. I know that you mentioned France, where they're not cooperatives. Those are stock ownership plans. They absolutely do buy in. But you, as you also mentioned, it's not required to work there. You don't have to actually be a, an, an, an equity owner to, to work at those businesses. So every cooperative is different. Um, I think that with regard to the idea of just getting rid of ownership as a concept and just basically you work at a place and you just get a democratic say and then you distribute the profits either back into the business or you know back into the workers pockets if that's what they want i think that there are probably some issues with this in general i mean i think that you know on one hand um you're talking about not owning the business at that point, really, right? You have democratic say, but it's not ownership of the means of production, right? You can be fired at any time based on a democratic say. Um, the cumulative capital growth and, uh, and expansion of that business. Well, I mean, according to you, basically nobody would own it, right? It, it would be, a, you know, it would, it would just be like a, I don't know, it would just be a legal entity that people worked at or didn't work at, right? Yeah, absolutely. If you join a worker cooperative, um, there would be a kind of internal share. Uh, you would, you, you know, you'd, you'd divvy it up like, like pirate booty. Um, if you had five people, it would go five ways, 10 and it would go 10 ways. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know why you would need to buy in necessarily. Now you could have systems where people could buy in. I'm not saying there aren't cooperatives that do that. There are, 
Um, but I don't think it's like a, a necessary thing. If you had like, a, for example, cooperatives that were just, I mean, if cooperatives were like normalized, I mean, if this was like the predominant economic model, I, I don't think they'd be expecting like 18 year olds to just pay in like $20,000 to get their, their, their first kick. We're not talking about partnership or whatever. We're just talking about they would go there and, you know, after I, I imagine some brief probationary period to make sure they're not, you know, trolling, I guess, um, they would have a say in the internal vote and they would be, I imagine, entitled to some portion of annual profits distributed across. Usually for these, the workers are entitled to like a percentage of profits split across however many people there are working there. And, you know, the individual pay structures vary massively according to these co-ops. But I think this entails essentially right. the same level of risk. The you're, you're correct, though. Nobody really owns the, um, the, the business, which is exactly how our government works. No person owns the White House. No person owns, you know, the, the, the Capitol Hill. There are institutions that we constructed that people can work in. There are people whose job it is to work in those facilities and people who are in charge of them, but not really ownership. Um, and I think that's a respectable model because that model means that the system through which those um, institutions are regulated, it can't just be the one whose name is on the deed. It has to be something more substantive than that. Obviously, our government's a shit show, so I'm not idealizing that, but I do like the fact that we have at least nominally a democracy, and I think businesses would work quite well the same, if for no other reason than because the total uh, development of the system would you know, lead to the elimination of private capital ownership, which I think is very politically necessary. Well, sure, but can you say, can you really say that you own the means of production when your ownership, when, when that's sort of, you know, when that surplus value is sort of accumulated within a distinct entity versus actually having, say, well, not say, but actually having ownership of that value increase over time. So for instance, what I mean by that is that, you know, say that you work at a business and, uh, you know, that business goes from being worth $100,000 to $400,000. Well, under an equal ownership model that I'm describing, um, or like some sort of buy-in model that I'm describing, uh, your ownership in that business, your work in that business, obviously under a reasonable framework, has increased the value of that business from 100,000 to 400,000, right? Your your wealth has you know quadrupled with regard to your investment in this business, right? But um, if the capital stock of that business, you have no right to it. Um, well, I'm not necessarily sure if we could really call that ownership, right? It's not ownership or in a we, capitalistic. We, 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 go, go, go. Oh, it was just yeah. It, you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. It's not ownership in a capitalistic method, but that's kind of the point. Um, democratic control, if you would prefer. Ownership of the means of production when used by Marx was uh, more of a class distinction that the worker is in control, owned in the same way that you could say that the citizens of a country own their government, you know, that we don't generally say that because we're quite disillusioned with democracies, at least domestically at the moment. But um, yeah, I, I, that's the principle to me. Um, and, and there are co-ops that function this way, you know, um, obviously with regards to the structure of, of, of cooperatives, like who is... Um, legally responsible if something goes wrong or who is responsible for like financial matters if the business goes insolvent we have cooperatives that solve that already without having any private ownership these are usually roles you could think of it as kind of stewardship of the estate um similar as to what you would do with a house that you don't own but take care of you know you're, it's, it's yours to take care of um yours to manage but you can do all of this without relying on the capitalist model of ownership uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. I, I guess, uh, we can kind of leave that there for now. I don't, well, it, it's not leave it there, but I think that I can, uh, move on to something that might be a little bit more substantive. So if we're purely just talking about sort of democratizing, you know, the workplace and industry in general, um, well then I'm, I'm not really sure how that can't necessarily be accomplished, uh, actually under a capitalist framework. Now, to be fair, under my framework, capital owners would still have, some sort of proportional say, right? If you buy stock in a business, you're still going to get a vote on how that business is run uh, to a certain extent, right? But um, I think under a model where you've got 50% worker board membership and unionization and incentives for worker cooperatives, um, I'm really not sure how workers are necessarily worse off in the system, right? What's, uh, what's the, you know, uh, why would it necessarily be wrong for a worker to be able to have the option to work at a business where they have you know, 50% worker board membership and they're represented by a union versus a cooperative. You know, why is that, why should that necessarily be precluded? Uh, why, why should that option be precluded from them in society when it's, you know, a similarly democratic framework? How is it similarly democratic? 
Well, if you elect half of the board members, then you're represented by a union, right? I, I feel like I feel like a lot of the concern of socialists is not an unreasonable concern, right? The idea that um, you know employees, or, or I'm sorry, not employees, but uh, the idea that companies, to a certain extent, have monopsony power, they're able to over leverage their uh, you know, their, their, their ownership in such a way that's harmful to the workers working there, either in the form of lower benefits, worse working conditions, um, less pay, right, um, generally getting treated like shit by their, you know, you know, their bosses and stuff like that. You know, that's a reasonable concern. Um, I think that things like unionization and worker board membership can basically, you know, get rid of those concerns um, in, you know, in whole part. Um, and also, if we're talking about a system where they do have the option to work at cooperatives if they really want to, um, I don't really see why that's a system that's necessarily sort of exploitative to the workers. I don't know how half of a democracy is the same as a democracy. If you had a Congress where half of the seats were just appointed foreign ministers with no democratic involvement, you couldn't fairly say that was a democratically chosen legislator, right? I mean, in practical terms, you know. Uh, well, if, but, well if, really quick, though, just to, to jump in, though, I, my, uh -huh. my value here isn't wholly democracy, right? It's, it, when it comes to democ democrat democratizing the workplace, that's not necessarily a bad goal. Um, but I, Would you I live don't under think a that. King? Well, no, that's, that's the next thing that I was going to say. The next sentence was that I'm not sure that sort of, you know, running civil, civil society or sort of that social construct uh, under a democratic framework is quite the same as running a business under a democratic framework. I'm not sure if the principle necessarily should cross apply there. And that's why I'm having, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to differentiate between the two. I'm not sure the analogies make as much sense. I think they're different, but in meaningful ways, they're very similar. In both instances, after all, you have institutions that have a huge amount of control over a person's life. The goal of systems which are larger than us is to align the interests of the people in charge of those systems with the interests of the people who must suffer the consequences of those systems. So in terms of our government, the idea of voting in representatives is that if the representatives act in our interests and do things that make us happy, we continue to vote them in. And if they don't, we vote against them. Thus, at least ideally, it's in their interest to act in our interest. And of course, that doesn't fucking work, but it works better, I suppose, than the Communist Party of China would or, you know, a comparable authoritarian government. The issue that we have with uh, economic authoritarianism is that the interests of the worker and of the owner are diametrically opposite. Uh, it is the interest of the worker to make as much money as possible and to have as much control over the place in which they work as possible. And the owner's well, the same, but for themselves. And those are opposite goals. Um, now, of course, you can ameliorate this. Uh, unions do a little bit to balance out the scales of power, a situation in which corporations will naturally have more power because they're an institution and a worker is just a person. But it doesn't change the fundamental relationship, which is one of antagonism. Um, I think that the, the ultimate goal of democracy isn't just uh, make number go up or even to make workers happier. It's to really align the institutions in our country with the needs of the people who work in those institutions. And a consequence that we have of not doing this is that in your case, if you had like 50% control by like shareholders, 50% by the workers, then all it would take is one worker to be bought by the shareholders for them to have essentially full control of the board. Any real decision making the shareholders are going to mostly agree on, at least relative to the workers, because the workers have diametrically opposite goals of the shareholders because they make their money in different ways. Um, they wouldn't have to buy off very many people at all for them to have essentially full control of the government. And so far, from what I can see, at least in Germany, uh, evidence has shown that partial worker control of the board doesn't really do that much to affect uh, worker involvement in the processes of the corporation. Now, I think they have 20 to 80. 50 to 50 would be more significant. I'd be interested to see any research on that. But I think principally, it's just not far enough, um, especially if you're goal, as it is with mine, the elimination of the bourgeois, the separate capital class, which can't really be done until every person in the country, or on earth, has the same relationship to the means of production. They have to make their money in the same way. Because otherwise, you have situations where very small numbers of very powerful people have diametrically opposed material interest to the rest of the country. You have these issues in government right now where you have all these really, really bad precedents being set, where there's a union of corporate and uh, government interests that lead to, well, it leads to something, but often it doesn't lead to stuff that's in the interest of the people necessarily. Yeah, I think that, 
you know, you, you, you say something that's interesting, you know, in, in meaningful ways, they're the same. Um, you know, the, the idea of a, you know, sort of a civic government versus the way you're governed at a corporation. Um, but also in meaningful ways, they're different, right? Um, you, you mentioned the idea that, you know, if we have representatives, we vote against them. That's a good thing. Well, obviously, you could say the exact same thing with a worker uh, board or a, or a union, right? Unions are oftentimes democratically run to a certain extent. There's union elections, right? You have union representatives. Um, you have union presidents uh, oftentimes. I'm not sure of any unions that operate any differently, um, to be fair. Um, obviously, when a union goes on a strike, for instance, that's something that has to be voted on by the union members, the workers, um, stuff like that, right? And so, you know, to me, this this sort of optional representation exists under my system as well. The, the difference is that I think my system is just generally uh, more efficient. And ultimately, again, I think we, I have to keep going back to that, you know, some what workers would just efficient? prefer. Well, I think that, you know, you get rid, uh, you, I think it's more of a uh, balancing act, I would say, right? So I think that uh, there's generally been fairly favorable results when governments uh, have to work with uh, different sort of corporate boards and stuff, you know, negotiating process. And I think there's also good sort of results. And there's good evidence to say that when a union negotiates with a uh, company, oftentimes they're, they they generally tend to meet in the middle and have, you know, end up getting better benefits and pay and stuff like that. And I think that similarly, if you're unsatisfied with your union representation, you can elect new ones. And if you're unsatisfied with your worker board rep representation, you can also elect new ones. Um, you Why mentioned that, uh, well, because I think capital investment is a, you know, has a reasonable seat at the table if they offer that investment in the first place. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the managers or, you know, the, the, the current owners or who, you know, whoever is running that business in the first place agrees to that investment. I think it's a fine thing for a company to say, hey, we're taking your money and this money comes with it some sort of actionable decision making capacity. Now, to be fair, a shareholder ultimately, like what's the ultimate authority that a shareholder has over a business? Well, um, you know, it's, it's the board membership elections in the first place. That's like the most direct authority that a shareholder has over uh, a corporation. For instance, if you bought Shell stock tomorrow, um, you can't just walk into Shell headquarters and act like you're the owner of the place. Technically, you are, right? But really, your ownership typically just confers a vote on the uh, on the board, right? And the influence thereof. And I think that giving that same exact influence over to um, you know all the all the influence that we would be scared of uh, from a socialist perspective, right? That business owners are um, you know exerting their influence in the form of these board elections. Well, we're just giving the exact same um, sort of influence over to workers, and, and I think scared. that makes for we're not scared more valuable of power, uh, paradigm. Only who has it? We're not afraid. That's what of I'm saying. The idea yeah. of people having that decision-making power. Um, a couple of things. No, no, First no. Of that, all, that, that, that's not what I'm saying. No, no. So really quickly, that, that's not what I'm saying though. What I'm saying is that the effects of that ownership is really, you know, necessarily the thing that is worrisome under a socialist framework, right? I'm just saying that. Those, those same powers can be transferred to workers um, and they would necessarily have a better seat at the negotiating table. I had, I had two more quick points. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, you know Germany has 80-20. Um, as far as I'm aware, Germany also has 50-50. Uh, um, it's 50-50 for like big businesses, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then they go from there. Boards are actually relatively small. So you know if a corporate board is like eight people, you know it's it's not the most bureaucratic nightmare to, to elect uh, another eight people to that board, just be you know worker representatives. Um, you mentioned the idea that it would only take one worker to be swayed by the shareholders. Well, similarly, it'd only take one shareholder to be, uh, or only one like shareholder elected board member to be swayed by uh, you know, the, the workers or the more activist shareholders, which is, you know, can happen under today's framework and has happened under uh, today's framework. Um, and the last thing you mentioned was that, you know, I, I think this is maybe a, a way we can take it as well is that the interests of workers and owners are fundamentally opposed. Um, I would say the same thing about all trade uh, relationships, right? The interests of like the United States and Canada are fundamentally opposed when you're talking about negotiating a trade deal. Um, now, we could frame it that way, but I think that there is a joint interest there and that that joint interest can create sort of net value, right? That plug and play and, and or, or give and take, I should say, between like Canada and America is very valuable. And I think similarly, there's a lot of value created when there is a give and take between like a union and a corporation. That's why um, it doesn't tend to be the case that, uh, you know, workers that are represented by unions tend to be worse or less productive. Um, but it does tend to be the case that uh, despite those companies being able to maintain their profits and efficiency, um, it, it does tend to be the case that workers uh, feel more satisfied, they get more benefits, they get more wages. And I think a similar sort of more, uh, I would analyze it more like a trading relationship than just, you know, uh, oh, you have diametrically opposed interests. And I think that that, that, uh, that lens of analysis is probably more useful when looking at uh, policy and, and these types of relationships in the first place. A couple of things. I think it's really odd that you would claim 
that it's more efficient to promote unions, which are just an extension of the antagonistic interests of the working class relative to the business owners, when unions are nothing more than a facsimile for the fact that owners don't have control itself. It, this is one of the issues I have, and you don't seem to understand. 50-50 isn't enough. Shareholders can have zero control. You say like, well, there's a chance that what workers could sway over one shareholder. I don't care. I don't want to live in a government where 50% of the legislator is foreign appointed officials and we have to just sway one of them. That's not acceptable to me. It's democracy or it's not. In terms of efficiency, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that direct worker control is inefficient. In fact, it seems to cut at the problem immediately by directly addressing the interior antagonisms, the power relationship between the workers and the owners having diametrically opposite interests. And I'd be interested in seeing how, in a system with full capital investiture relegated to worker cooperatives, you know, non-controlling shares and what have you, uh, how effectively something like that could be implemented. Because I think there are a lot of inefficiencies in traditional autocratic ownership, just as autocracies are inefficient in almost every large institution. Whether you're talking about mercantile corporations or dictatorial states, kingdoms, whatever, um, authoritarianism tends to carry with it a number of inefficiencies uh, for a great many reasons. An in unfamiliarity with the work being done at the ground level, um, and a, a lack of sympathy towards the interests of those beneath you, um, the consumption of um, ideology uh, on the part of the capital owners, which leads to them doing disastrous things out of some, I guess what you'd call uh, buying your own hype, like when the Sears guy um, it turned his uh, turned his businesses into that like ANCAP paradise and everything failed, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, stuff like that. Uh, so, so yeah, I don't, um, I think it's, it's democracy or, or, or bust really, um, w with regards to capital ownership necessarily conferring control, I don't see why it should. Um, the bank after all, doesn't get to control a house just because they signed off in the loan for it. Now, of course, if you can't pay your, you know, pay your, pay your payments back, then, um, you can foreclose and the, the, the house can go to them. Um, but in terms of management of the house, uh, while it is yours to control, the bank gets no say. I don't know why buying into or investing into something should necessarily confer um, any control over how that institution is run. It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Uh, with regards to the trade relationship analogy, I think that trade is fine when you're talking about two institutions of equal institutional power leveraging out things between them, but I don't think it works as well when it's institutions which control a great many people trying to fight with those people from what they can get. I mean, we see this in government, for example. We certainly don't have, at least ideally, an adversarial relationship um, with everything our government does. Like, we, ideally, the interest should be aligned because the better our lives are, the more productive we are, and the more likely we are to vote in people who probably want to stay in there for a second, third, fourth, fifth term. Um, uniting the interests is efficiency. It is efficient to cut through those middlemen. Um, and I just, I, I don't, I don't see the issue with full worker control. The last point that I want to make is, um, you ask yeah. why, what if, what's wrong with the worker wanting to work at a more traditionally managed business? Um, and my answer to that would be, I don't care. Uh, in the United States, you can't sign yourself into indentured servitude nor slavery. Um, and I'm fine with that. I think that people in, uh, there are plenty of economic situations where people can be forced into, uh, even if it's for their immediate benefit, conferring their freedom upon a system which does not owe it. And uh, I think that's a bad thing. I think it's okay to categorically prohibit anti-democratic systems. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, just writing some stuff down. Um, so yeah, so I guess I just, I just, you know, to go one by one on these, you know, you mentioned that you know, unions are nothing more than a representation that, you know, capitalists don't have all the power, right. As a counterbalance to that, because the consequences of that would be bad sort of, you know, I'm, I'm almost begging the question by saying that I'm in favor of, you know, union, uh, uh membership or, or, or worker board representation. Um, not necessarily. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly open with saying that I think that democratic structures, whether it be through unions or worker board membership are a good thing. Right. Um, you know, you, you for instance, you mentioned the idea that authoritarianism is inefficient. Uh, you have a lack of sympathy, a lot, you know, there's a local knowledge problem there. Um, these things are solved by the structures that I advocate for. Um, you know, it, that, that goes into the idea that you mentioned that, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? There's no evidence that, 
uh, worker ownership is necessarily inefficient. Um, what there is evidence of is that the efficiency gains and the, producti the productivity gains of you know, worker uh, cooperatives are not necessarily homogenous. You know, every study that I've looked at with regard to uh, worker-owned businesses or you know, employee-managed businesses and their relative productivity or profitability or you know, whatever have you, um, pretty much often, I, I've never seen a study that doesn't tend to say that um, our, you know, these results were not homogenous across industries. Some industries did better than others. Um, what I found consistently in the data was remarkable inconsistency with how well uh, worker enterprises did, um, which isn't to say that they're bad. It's just to say that depending on when the study was done, depending on where the study was done, um, and depending on the uh, the industries that were looked at, um, worker uh, managed businesses tended to do um, better and worse depending on all three of those factors. Um, for instance, in the Italian, the the, the northern uh, Italian region, uh, Emilia Romagna, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, where uh, a, a huge portion of the economy is cooperatively managed and, and organized, um, it's still only about 10% of workers that work for cooperatives. These are mostly producer cooperatives, which means they're having the agricultural industry. Um, and then most every other businesses, uh, business is, is, uh, is not cooperatively run. That's, that's in one of the most incentivized sort of culturally favorable environments for cooperatives. And so I think that the, you know, the idea that this would necessarily um, you know, lead to efficiency gains, I'm sure is, is, is a bit dubious, especially when it's mandated. I think that you'd end up in a system where you're incentivizing them, you'd end up in a system where worker cooperatives sort themselves into the industries that they do, that they do best in. Um, and I think that that's probably better, um, not just for the economy, obviously, but you know, generally for everyone, right? That you know, when, when the economy is efficient, it's, it's generally better for everyone, especially under a democratic framework where a lot of those gains are, are redistributed in the first place. Um, next, you know, the next couple things you mentioned that um, banks, banks don't get a say in how uh, you, like your house is run because they lent you money. Um, well, well, obviously, this is a debt market, not an ownership market, right? So, I mean, you, you agreed to lend me money. You didn't agree to sell me the, uh, you know, the, 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 you know the, the ownership in the house necessarily, right? I own the house. You just gave me the money to buy it, right? That's why there's a difference there. Um, if you're talking about, you know, well, um, you could raise capital just through debt in a uh, worker cooperative society or non-voting shares, I think that there's probably some, some capital formation problems there. Raising capital is a really powerful tool for the economy. And I think in, an, in, a, in, a, in a system where you're either primarily reliant on banks or entirely reliant on banks, I think is probably a system worse than we have now. Um, you mentioned that with regard to trade, you know, it's not good to have you know, an entirely adversarial relationship, right? But I think that you can absolutely have this in, uh, you know, a, a trade agreements with uh, different nations, right? You no, know, you know, so nations trade with each other when they do have entirely adversarial interests, right? Despite the fact that we have an entirely adversarial relationship with China, um, we do still trade with them quite a lot, despite all the terrorists and stuff that have been, you know, engaged in. I wouldn't say that trade itself is bad. I might just say that that particular relationship is bad and probably warrants some sort of endogenous or exogenous force, right? Similarly to how I could agree that many workplaces are bad, um, but I wouldn't say that it's like the relationship itself that is inherently the problem. And I'd make the exact same argument with trade. Um, you mentioned the last thing you mentioned was that you know in the U.S. you can't sign yourself up for uh, slavery or for indentured servitude. Um, I, I just have to reject the analogy in general here. I've seen socialists say this a lot. I don't think that. I don't think working at, like, I don't think getting a job at, like, you know, a, you know, Starbucks or something, I don't think that that's the same as being, like, a chattel slave or being an indentured servant. Um, and, and I'm not even, I don't even think you'd necessarily say that they are the same. You're just drawing an analogy. I just think the analogy is so off base here that, it, that it's, it's hard to really reconcile with. Um, and also, to be fair, um, you know, you, you, you can indeed in America work uh, for free, right? But you still have the same rights as any worker. Um, it's called an internship, right? You can also volunteer your time um, and, and, and things like that. Um, Don't that's worry. not to say that- We'll make those illegal too. <laughs> yeah, sure. But I'm just, I'm just saying that, you know, the, the analogy I think breaks down fundamentally. And I think that um, ultimately it's, it's sort of emblematic of the lack of flexibility. You know, internships aren't necessarily the worst thing in the world, um, you know, to, to, to offer people to do. Um, I, you know, you and I both have probably known many people who have springboarded successful careers based off of internships they were able to get when they were younger. Um, and I don't think that that is necessarily the worst thing. Um, but I also don't think it's anywhere close to being a slave. They are the same. It's a continuation of a historical form, uh, types of labor which deny autonomy to the working class. It was more explicit under slavery and under indentured servitude, and you could get away with that. And there are plenty of places that still have slavery and indentured servitude, of course, we're not done with that. But here in the United States, you know, we have at least 
for now, done away with those forms, but there's an underlying insidious nature to these systems which goes beyond just the explicit brutality of slavery. It is the fact that in those systems, as is the case with this system that we live in now, as a class, there is a political consequence to the denial of democratic rights. It goes beyond just being able to rearrange your Starbucks, you know, um, like counter the way you want or getting a little bit of extra money because you're entitled to a portion of profits. Uh, it means that when it comes to the people in this country who have the most power and make the most important decisions, they are overwhelmingly not workers. In a real democracy, this would not be the case. Because a worker and an owner, or a member of the bourgeois, have very different economic interests. Very, very different. They make money in different ways, they benefit from different policies, they have an interest in different kinds of investment, different kinds of tax structures. These are incredibly important policy-based differences uh, that will affect their reasoning over ours. And the issue is they're not just in government, of course. They obviously, by definition, run the corporations, and they overwhelmingly run and present at news media. This isn't conspiratorial, I hope. It's just true. It's what they do. Um, and for that reason, um, essentially all political narrative making, all uh, messaging that we get broadly in this country and in every other capitalist country, is filtered through the lens of bourgeois interest, through their capital interest, through their class interest. Um, and the political consequences of this are very real. My support of worker democracy goes well beyond I think people should be happier in their workplace. The issue is that as the way things stand right now, there are groups with different interests and the group who has the other set of interests controls everything. We are not similar to the bourgeois. They do not share our interests. We have more in common. And I say we as though I'm a member of the working class as a live streamer, but let's just pretend for a moment that I'm speaking on behalf now, of the working well, class. Well, te technically you are, right? I te technically, but in terms of I material... I mean, you're, you're part of the proletariat. Well, I, I don't... Well, I guess you're not, because you own a, a business. Maybe maybe you wouldn't... Maybe I shouldn't say no, that. No, I don't I, even have you that registered. Saying. Yeah, let's, let's say uh, that I, as a, you know... You're in um, a gray area. Petite yeah, sure. bourgeois labor aristocrat um, live streamer I think I would have more in common with a, you know, Taiwanese worker than Elon Musk in terms of material interest and what policies I would want passed for my government at the very least. So I think it's critical to think of things that way. When leftists talk about wage slavery, democracy and all this, it sounds heady and, you know, uh, self-important and uh, over-exaggerated. But, you know, one of the big reasons why we're facing down the barrel of a climate crisis is because the media institutions in this country and others are largely put forward by people who are good friends with barons in the coal and oil industry, as are a lot of politicians. So the system we're in right now, I mean, we're staring down a couple billion deaths in a few decades. I mean, I think we're talking about the political divide here, you know, between people who can build survival yachts and people who cannot is going to become increasingly significant as time goes on. Which is the reason why I don't even care to respond to your earlier points about non-homogenous efficiency industry to industry. The economy can shrink for all I care. I think that it won't. I think that the evidence we have for worker cooperatives is largely earnest and optimistic. I want more evidence on this, of course. I want things to be implemented carefully and effectively. But even if things went down for a bit, much as the same way that I supported the American Revolution, even though that did lead to an immediate decrease in the economic productivity of the former colonies, uh, I think there's something materially useful there that's difficult to put into a GDP chart. Sure. Okay. Um, I think that, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I mean, if you, if you want to concede that, well, not concede, but if you want to not, I don't want to say that frames it unfairly. If, if you want to say that basically it's irrelevant to me, that the, the potential economic consequences of what I'm saying, um, that's fair enough. I mean, I understand that we, you know, we make moral decisions in economics all the time, right? Um, you know, we don't, uh, we don't allow, you know, uh, we don't allow eight-year-olds to work at coal mines, right? Uh, because we've decided that, yeah, that's we just that's just not okay, but right? Given, um, now, to be fair, to, yeah, just go to be on, clear, sorry. Given the current info, I don't think there would be severe economic consequences. It's possible no, that some yeah. industries would be right. I just I want to say that that's not the thing I'm hung up on, but I don't want to uh, give the impression that the evidence suggests there would be this, you know, like economic sure. catastrophe. Yeah, and that's why I, I rephrased myself because I don't want to give the impression that you are giving that impression either. I would just say that 
with regard to the um, w w you know la last point I suppose on the more economic side of the debate I would just say that um, and, and you might even agree with this I would just say that the the economy would be more productive um, if we had incentivized co-ops that can sort themselves out versus mandated co-ops um, now obviously to you know to my uh, to my point I, I couldn't tell you how much less productive I could just say that with relative confidence that it would just be less productive than otherwise would. Um, now, I would say that that's bad because it doesn't allow you to redistribute as much. Um, you know, consumer uh, prices probably go up. People might have less discretionary income. I think there's a lot of extrapolative effects from there that would be quite negative for society. Um, but to be fair, without putting a number on it, you know, uh, you did say to be fair that if it, would, it, was, it was just truly so bad for the economy, you'd probably move off of your position. But I can't say how bad it is. Um, so we can probably just leave it there um, with regard to the more sort of um, okay. almost philosophical points um, with regard to the more sort of philosophical points, you know, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, there's political consequences to being denied uh, these sort of voting rights uh, in your company. Um, to be fair, um, I might agree to a certain extent. That's why I'm in favor of democratic structures in the workplace. I'm just not in favor of this strict democratic structure for all those economic reasons. Um, you say that uh, people make the, you know, people making the real decisions are not the working class, it's the bourgeois. Um, but I'm not actually sure how true this is, right? Um, it seems to me, based on my sort of survey of, of the literature and what I've done, um, the, the median voter, you know, the people that vote tend to actually be fairly well represented. Now, we might say that, um, well, the, the median voter is disproportionately, uh, you could say, just different in general from the sort of average working class person. And I might agree to that uh, to a certain extent. I I'm not sure exactly how true that is. I'd have to look at the statistics. But um, that's just to say that our democratic system works, right? And I would say that with regard to policy, I think people tend to get the policies that the people who vote tend to vote for. Can I interject um, that has very been... briefly? Yeah, go for it. Where are these people educated on those policies from? Well, they're educated in Marxist universities, Bosch. But where are they really educated from? <laughs> I'm not sure. You have to. Were you talking about the news media or whatever? I was going to actually talk about that next. Okay. We. This is manufacturing consent. The idea that people. Yeah. So, for example, people in China broadly support their government. People in Nazi Germany broadly supported their government. People support what they're told is good to support, and some hegemonies go unquestioned. In the United States, a you know the Great America. Um, the American exceptionalist capitalist country that, you know, straddles the world. Um, we are presented information uh, in, a, in a narrativized manner. Um, and, I, and I do think that influences what people think they ought to vote for. You know, a lack of class consciousness. Yeah, I think, yeah, so exactly. And this goes on to what I was about to say. I could tell you were kind of getting at the manufacturing consent issue. I think it's a valuable thing to bring up because it's a good point. Um, it's a good, it's a good narrative, I would say, by Chomsky and, and, and Herman, uh, the, 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 the oft forgot second author of, of manufacturing consent. But I, I think that the issue is that, at least from, from my reading of manufacturing consent, all the actual fundamental conditions of manufacturing consent would actually still exist in uh, a market socialist system. It's just that the, uh, the, 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 the interests shift from, uh, you could say from like capital owners to just the worker owners, right? So, for instance, Chomsky and Herman talk about you know mass media adhering to owner demands. Well, obviously these owners still exist. It's just the workers instead of uh, you know instead of capital owners. It's not to say that they wouldn't have their unique interests that might be at the detriment uh, of society. Um, you know they they talk about uh, they link this in with the idea of the role of advertising dollars. How you know advertising campaigns and advertising dollars uh, heavily influence what we see and what we're told, um, and that this is a toxic relationship. Obviously. Advertising cooperatives would still have all the same incentives under a market socialist system. They talk about the the powerful bottleneck and 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 and, and, and gatekeep uh, that mass media uh, uses to control the narrative. That you know the the powerful basically prevent you from being able to write stories because they have access to the powerful people. Well, um, you know th this this sort of lobbying effort would just shift from capital owners to uh, worker owners. There's no reason why you know worker cooperatives wouldn't have their own special interests that they would lobby uh, the government on behalf of. Um, they talk about flack. You know the idea that you can get sued for reporting something that's considered controversial. Um, well, again, you know, if you report something controversial about a huge cooperative, I can see why you might be scared of being sued by that huge cooperative, despite the fact that you're a cooperative and they're a cooperative. Um, and the last thing uh, that I that I found from uh, the book was that uh, they, they talk about, um, you know, anti-communism or the war on terror as a means of uh, social control, right? Well, all this sort of mass hysteria and government apparatuses could certainly still exist under a market socialist uh, system. You know, you, you, you talk about how, uh, in general, that this relationship is 
is necessarily toxic, but all of these same sort of fundamental structures would uh, almost necessarily exist under under you know under a market socialist system. And the last thing that I would say is that um, you talk about you know uh, people supporting what they're told, right? The the the, the, the just the, the core of manufacturing consent, right? People believe what they're told on the news media. Um, but I think that there's some issues with this narrative. One is that um, it's pretty hard for news media to have like a like a ubiquitously true narrative, right? I mean, look at the people do it all the time. Obviously, mass media courses your first day, you might learn about how you know CNN and Fox News reporting on the same exact story are going to have totally different uh, lenses of analysis, and this is true with regard to um, pretty much every issue. Um, it's not quite a homogenous media landscape. Um, now, you might say it's homogenous in the term of supporting capital owners, but I'm really not sure what that means in this regard. I mean, obviously, there's progressive news media networks. Um, there's, you know, progressive shows. There's right-wing shows that are very anti sort of corporate. Um, you know, obviously, we, you know, the, 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 the very, very anti-big business Tucker Carlson, right, uh, even though he's obviously a, you know, big bit of a crazy guy. But you, you get what I'm saying, though, that I, I just don't, I don't really buy the argument that while at the same time, these, these capital owners are truly controlling everything and truly manufacturing consent, um, it seems like they're quite bad at it um, because it seems like all the you know most of the systems we've implemented uh, with regard to sort of social spending and, and and worker rights and stuff like that have been fairly robust over time. It seems like they can't really get a, quite a homogenous narrative on the news media. And to be fair, all the problems associated with that um, would still exist under a market socialist system. So a few points. Um, yep. With regards to, hmm, okay. Um, Go for it. You're correct in saying that the leaders of worker cooperatives would continue to act in and lobby for their material interests. But there's a critical distinction there, actually several, the largest of which yep. is that they would be advocating solely for their business, not for the bourgeois as a class. The issue right now is that the shareholders and CEOs of every corporation on earth fundamentally share essentially the same relationship to their governments and the policies that they want passed. Because the ultra wealthy who make their money off the back of other labor's uh, work, um, they share a lot of uh, characteristics in common. Obviously, wealth is one of them. The way in which they make their money, the way in which they tend to be taxed, those are big ones. Um, but the, more critically, they're insulated from the material interests of the working class and of the poor. Meaning that, or to put it another way, um, if in a worker cooperative society, you had you know, cooperative Exxon, who um, found evidence of climate change in the 1970s, lied about it, burned the papers, and then, you know, denied, denied, denied. Um, I think there's a huge difference between them doing so individually as a cooperative, solely in favor of their own interest, their own selfish desire to pr preserve their company, as opposed to uh, them working in tandem with the broader business class, which is exactly what happened, you know? If you take a look right now at how these narratives are promoted, it's not just the coal industry fights for the coal industry. It's the wealthy as a group, not in totality, but at least in significant enough numbers that it becomes more than just Exxon doing this stuff. Uh, they act in unison. They have class consciousness. Um, they fall in line because at the end of the day, the systems that allow Exxon to keep power are the systems that allow essentially the rest of them to keep power. None of them want regulation. None of them want the federal government looking too closely into how their businesses run. None of them want the EPA to have more power than they already do because the EPA's power is always going to be to the detriment, or at least overwhelmingly so, of these corporations. It goes beyond the interest just of this company and turns into a broader class-based interest. I think transparency would also be a big one. In a uh, authoritarian firm, let's take again Exxon, if they wanted to do research on climate change, uh, you know, burn the documents, uh, oh, climate change isn't real, lie, lie, lie. In an authoritarian firm, you can get away with that. Tell everyone involved in the process that their ass is grass if they come out with it, and that's that. You know, it's internal corporate research. There's no legal, like, whatever. They keep, you get to keep, hey, enjoy your $300,000 a year job in the, in the Cayman Islands. You know, have fun. Just don't ever talk about this. In a democratically run business, of course, the millions of people who work directly or indirectly for this company might be really negatively affected by the idea of ending the world, which would affect them directly because they can't afford the yacht palaces that the wealthy people who run an authoritarian corporation might be able to transparency is a necessary component of democracy. And for that reason, that means not only do you have more potential for whistleblowers, you also have more potential for dissident within 
the institution itself. And any CEO or any head leader or whatever of, you know, democratically controlled Exxon would quickly find themselves out of a job if it was found out by the hundreds of thousands of people who worked beneath them uh, that they were bringing the planet to a state which would soon lead to uh, the, the flooding of the places that they currently live in. Uh, I know that sounds a bit idealistic, but I genuinely believe that would be the case absent the wow. decades of misinformation that we've seen concerning climate change. And if you don't think they can push narratives when they need to, a third of Americans don't believe in climate change. Like, that is insane. There's no reason to not believe in climate change. It's like a 100 to 0 issue. It's very straightforward. But because of a dedicated media campaign uh, over decades, not only is this like a big subject of debate here, it's we can't even do anything about it federally because the Republican Party is principally against any kind of climate change uh, action because the Senate is always going to be disproportionately rural voted and thus red. So now what was originally one company lying turned into the media in bed with that company promoting disinfo turned into an entire political party opposing any action on the subject, which will, as we'll find out in a few decades, uh, end most human life. So I think this is directly downstream of the lack of transparency and the lack of oversight and the lack of control uh, working class people have over these big institutions, um, which is why you see whistleblowing a lot more commonly in democratic governments as opposed to authoritarian governments. Any system where you give more leeway for the common people to second guess, to double check, to see what's really happening, you get more opportunities to have these big conspiracies or big problems like busted wide open, you know? Um, so that's... so. Would cooperative ownership fix lobbying and corporate interest? It absolutely would not. But I think there are ways in which it would be meaningfully different, and those are the main ways. So the main, so just to get it clear, the main ways would be transparency, and maybe I missed the first way. Well, what's like the distinct two things besides trans? What's the other thing besides transparency? Oh, Trans the, the class itself, right? Transparency, oversight, and they could only ever lobby in favor of their business, not in favor of themselves as a as an economic class, as the bourgeois. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, so, yeah, okay. So I, I think I can respond to each of these. So, um, you know, you, you, you talk about, you know, they, they'd only be arguing in favor of their business, not but not the sort of bourgeois as a class, right? But I, I would say that there'd still be distinct class interests um, in in this society, right? I mean, obviously we would, we you know, I, you're, you're, m most socialists aren't of the persuasion anymore, the idea that everyone would be truly equal, right? Or, or Nor the idea that everyone would have like some sort of perfect distribution or flat management uh, of their cooperative, right? So there'd still be managerial classes under your system and there would still be a material interest uh, differentiating many different people depending on where they worked, uh, what kind of cooperative they worked at, um, and, 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 you know, frankly, just where they grew up, obviously, just their own political persuasion, right? There'd still be distinct class interests that could have toxic effects on, uh, you know, the sort of political orientation of local politics and perhaps have an outsized influence or perhaps even a, uh, you know, just a straight up negative influence on national politics. So I think that that still uh, would exist. You use the example of, you know, cooperative, you know, cooperative Exxon uh, might have still destroyed the evidence for climate change, but we wouldn't have seen any sort of broader apparatus of action as a result of this. I really don't see why not, right? If every oil company was a cooperative, um, there's no reason to think why the cooperative oil companies of the day wouldn't have the same exact material interest to destroy that evidence uh, and go from there. Um, this kind of leads into your idea that, you know, none of the bourgeois want, uh, you, you know, EPA regulations, uh, worker safety regulations, regulations in general, um, to which I would just say, uh, well, obviously, uh, you know, the same types of cooperatives wouldn't have this, you know, they, they'd have the, the exact same incentive structure uh, to not want those things as well. If you're a cooperative uh, who, for instance, relies heavily on contracted labor, um, you, you know, maybe you're contracting from a cooperative, but you're still just incentivized to not want, uh, you, you know, worker regulations uh, or, you know, safety regulations, things like that. You're, you're still just incentivized to destroy the environment and not want the EPA. Um, the material interest still exists. Moving on to your, your, your transparency point, um, I'm not really sure that this is necessarily true, right? We're assuming that every um, worker cooperative is, is, a, is a flat, um, pure, uh, sort of pure democracy, um, which I'm not sure we would reasonably assume, especially if, if, if it's true that worker cooperatives could actually be big, right? When you see uh, like Mondragon, for instance, which is sort of the classic example of large scale cooperative organization, um, they have a representative democracy and only, you know, 29, 30% of their 
uh, employees or actually members of their cooperative because it has such a problem uh, with scaling. But that's more of an economic point, and, and we're, we're, we're kind of uh, we're, we're kind of moving on uh, from there. But that's just to say that obviously the upper management of Mondragon would would certainly be able to um, relatively easily uh, keep secrets from uh, you know the, the 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 sort of lower, more entry level, or perhaps uh, you know just the, the the workers who aren't involved in the representative council of democracy. I'm not sure why we would expect necessarily that worker cooperatives would be more transparent, uh, even internally, uh, than than regular old. Uh, businesses, you're right that you know you, 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 I, I would probably be willing to concede that um, they're probably more internally uh, transparent. Um, but just because we have a transparent, uh, relatively transparent democracy in most every country, you know, every country still has intelligence uh, agencies. They still have secrets that they keep for national security reasons. And I think similarly, you know, you you, you pull back the Exxon uh, example uh, here, which is to say that. If the workers of, of, of Worker Cooperative Exxon found out that their managers, which they'd be more likely to find out um, that their managers are, are hiding this information from the public, they would fire their managers for trying to keep this a secret. I actually don't agree at all with this. I don't think they'd be uh, likely to, to fire them at all. There might be some sort of sanctions. There might be a suspension. Um, but I don't think that, that material interest fundamentally changes. Um, I don't think that they would be there would be some uproar that would cause Worker Cooperative Exxon to be more environmentally conscious. No, not at all. Um, this leads into your last point, which is the idea that there's no... Um, there, there's no reason not to believe in climate change. I agree that there's no scientific reason. I certainly agree with that. And I think that's probably what you meant to say, but there's absolutely a material reason for people not to believe in climate change. You know, for instance, um, you know, the, the material interest of coal workers, right? They're, they're, they're incentivized not to take this seriously, not to believe in it. Um, and they're incentivized because, um, yeah, because of the huge moral hazard that exists with regard to pollution and, and sort of environmental degradation in general, right? Environmental degradation that's caused by a select group of people is never going to only hurt that select group of people. So while they're profiting from environmental degradation, everyone else is sort of spreading across um, that uh, you know that that harm. And if anything, they might be disproportionately uh, not hurt by it. You know, for instance, they might be wealthy enough to build seawalls or wealthy enough to move to areas that aren't low lying and not flooded, right? So there's there's all of these dynamics at play that would actually lead, uh, you know, in my opinion, uh, to to a society with regard to the information dissemination of climate change not being fundamentally different. Um, uh, th then today, I'm not sure that those numbers would actually change at all. All the same things exist under your system. The material interest causes all of these things to exist, and that fundamental material interest is not uh, not uh, by by any means, in my opinion, really significantly addressed. I'll give you half. I'll, I'll give you half a point on the transparency thing. That's probably true, um, but I really don't think it would lead to uh, a, a, a far different outcome. And, and the last thing that I would say is that. I'm not sure that we would even necessarily expect a far different outcome from, or in terms of the transparency, in terms of all the, you know, the, the class interests and all that stuff. I don't really think we'd expect a far different outcome from my system, which is unionization and worker board membership, right? When you've got workers representing half of all boards, you'd probably get all the same transparency benefits. But like I said, I'm not sure we can necessarily kick ourselves out of the material interests. I think that what that requires is a broad and a deep democratic uh, structure nationally, uh, which is what we have now. And to be fair, uh, which is shown to be uh, fairly robust, right? We still have the EPA environmental regulations that tend to get better and better over time. We're cutting emissions, right? So, uh, you know, I think that that broad democratic structure in our government is really what solves those sort of individual material interests, not actually transforming our economy into a worker uh, sort of cooperative oriented economy. First of all, EPA regulations have been getting gutted, and their most recent gutting was because a member of the bourgeois who had a material incentive to oppose EPA regulations was put in charge with the EPA. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I wish it was getting better with time. Um, they could do a lot better. I think that one of the issues I have here is because I often feel like, I often feel yeah. like opposition to the, the glorious worker social, uh, 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 you know, um, market socialist society that I advocate for. Um, it, it, sometimes it's presented as like a policy thing, but I think it's, it's actually quite ideological. I disagree with you on a lot of these things here. Yeah. Well, the, I feel like, well, to be fair though, let, let me just jump in there. I, I feel like I did, I, I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't a very empirical response, right? I did give a fairly ideological sort of you know, teasing it out type response. You know, I, I'm talking about material interests and things like that. I, you know, I'm not quoting any data when I when I give that response, right? No, no, of course, of course. And when it comes to stuff like this, it's difficult to, but I feel like there's, it's it's the ideology again. With regards to like material interest, coal miners would still argue against climate change. When we take a look at people who oppose or who don't believe in climate change in the US, we're talking about people who do so because they watch Fox News. 
not because they're like coal miners or oil rig workers who because there's a difference between not believing in climate change and not thinking we should do anything about it. If the argument was really about whether or not we should do anything about it, then that would be what they would promote over Fox News or whatever. But instead, it's about disbelieving it in general. I think that generally workers in the coal industry in America are generally in favor of stronger ecological regulations. Um, and what's more, I think um, if you take a look at plenty of other countries in the world, they have oil workers, they have coal workers, they don't have this big debate about climate change. Like, you can, like, would there still be people who would argue against climate change or who would, like, um, you know, disbelieve in it because they're conspiracy theorists? Sure, but not like a third of the population. That was very, very deliberately a product of disinfo pushed by the bourgeois. And the only reason the news companies lied for Exxon and lied for all of them is because Murdoch has is like buddy-buddy with them. They're all golf buddies. They have shared capital interests. Sometimes they literally mutually invest, but I don't believe in mutual investment. In my system, there would be no way for a person who runs the news stations to also have a huge stake in the oil companies. There would be no way for a single person to have this vertical control over all the systems by which they can disseminate information from having semi-control over the oil being taken from the earth to how the news promotes the interests of those industries broadly to being friends with politicians to make sure regulations don't go through that won't be possible i don't think there's any reason co-op news company would vote for or sorry not vote for lie for co-op exxon except for like the possibility that the elected leaders of both of those corporations for some reason, despite not being ultra-wealthy plutocrats who visit Epstein's island because they wouldn't be paid that much more than the average worker, would be like personal friends. And that personal friendship would then have to involve a conspiracy where they would collaborate information in both groups and disseminate it through thousands of employees on both ends of things in order to promote misinformation. I just don't think it's possible. We know that transparency is much easier to arrive at in democratic systems. We see this clearly. Chi according to China, they had like 200 COVID deaths. Can you prove that they didn't? I can't. Um, the more democratic a system is, the lower the consequences are for speaking out, the more likely info is to get out. Right now, in basically every corporation in America, if you do anything they don't like, they can just fire you. Um, they can blacklist you from the industry, depending on how high up you are. If you're like a middle manager who like it uh, 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 gives indications of wrongdoing, they're not just going to fire you. Nobody else is ever going to hire you. Why would they? They know you're a rat. They would never, ever, ever do it. Whereas that couldn't happen in this system because firing would be done democratically. And those like leaders in co-op Exxon would have to convince the people whose job it is to fire you to fire you for leaking the fact that your corporation is doing a thing that will lead to their children being homeless in 30 years. Like, it, uh, the, the systems just don't line up. We know authoritarianism is inefficient. We see this. this. This can be born empirically. So we need to hit this at the root of the problem. It's not enough to preserve the bourgeois and just give the workers breadcrumbs. We can't give them, you know, this, this, um, you know, this, this weak half measure. Um, uh, capital investment should just be done away with. Uh, we can find ways to replace these systems without allowing different economic interests to fester in different groups. I, I know we can. We have co-ops. We know forms of investment outside of um, controlling shares exist. That was like the majority of investment for a long time. You know, the, the stock market is a relatively new thing. Um, and while controlling shares as a concept have been around for a long time, like that's far from the only thing we have, you know? I get what you're saying. Um, so I would, you know, to respond you know, sort of line by line here, bringing back to the broader point, um, you know, you mentioned that EPA regulations have been gutted. So I would say broadly, they actually haven't. Now, we, we have seen some ebb and flow here. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, Trump did appoint a coal uh, lawyer as the head of the EPA, which didn't exactly help anything. But, you know, before that, uh, there was, I think, the last head of the EPA before Trump was a, uh, a nuclear uh, physicist or some sort of chemist or something like that. Um, and then the head of the EPA right now is, uh, you know, I'm sure just fine uh, under Biden in a relative sense. Um, you know, Yale actually did a and in, in a quote unquote environmental performance index, which tried to basically uh, index all the sustainability and sort of environmental policies of governments uh, over the course of a 10 year period. 
Um, and what they found was that 70% of countries actually improved over the last decade to a significant degree, um, at least measurable based on their index. Um, and these are obviously mostly, you know, most every, you, you might say that every country is a capitalist country, right? So that might, maybe it's a little bit, uh, you know, towards my point, um, you know, to your next point, the idea that people don't believe in climate change because they watch Fox News. Um, well, I would say that again, that the niche of the niche of radical right wing politics would still exist in uh, or even, you know, you could say even reactionary politics would still exist in uh, a, a, a market socialist system. That market would still be there because those people would still be there. Right. And so that that niche would still be filled by someone. Right. It might be cooperative Fox News. Um, but in general, I'm not sure we would necessarily say um, that, that couldn't exist. You, know, you say that there's no way that uh, cooperative CNN would necessarily cooperate with uh, cooperative Exxon. Uh, it's a lot of cooperatives there. But I would say that there is actually a reason that they would. Chomsky would say that it might be advertising dollars, right? It might be access uh, to politicians uh, and, and, and lobbying interests, right? Um, that's something that uh, Chomsky points out in manufacturing uh, consent. So I don't see uh, why it wouldn't necessarily be the case that certain uh, wealthy cooperatives and certain, you know, sort of, uh, you know, broadly popular news organizations, you know, cooperative news organizations wouldn't necessarily, um, from their manager's perspective or from just their entire sort of class interest perspective, um, take these same sorts of views uh, in their systems. Um, you know, uh, for instance, you say, I think this sort of um, doesn't beg the question, but it sort of gives away the, uh, you, you, you know, gives away, uh, I think it, I think it implicitly concedes to what sort of my frame of view would be, which would be that, you know, other countries have coal workers, but they don't have the same problem with climate denial. Those other countries you're referencing are, are capitalist countries, right? And so I, I would actually agree that there are uh, ways that capitalist systems can properly respond to this quote unquote manufacturing consent problem or a dissemination of, inf of misinformation um, or generally like a, a, f a failure of our education system to a certain extent, like all the things that might cause American society to be uh, more skeptical of climate change. Um, I just don't think it's, uh, you know, the fault necessarily of the, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's the fault of people being able to buy shares of a business. That's fundamentally what we're talking about here. Um, and I don't think that all of those problems can be fundamentally solved or, or shifted um, by by getting away uh, or by probably just getting rid of that uh, sort of transaction could we uh, go, in the first place. Could um, we go point for point? Uh, yeah. And I, well, the, the last point I was going to make, okay. uh, well, I'm uh, sorry, the last two points was going to be that um, you mentioned transparency gains, uh, you know, again, that transparency is fundamentally the thing that would solve these things. Well, you know, you'd have all the same transparency gains with 50 percent worker board membership. They're an equal member of the board. They'd have all the access to the same files that anyone else uh, would have access to. They'd have all the rights of board members. So there's no transparency gain under a worker cooperative system that wouldn't necessarily be afforded to a system with worker board membership. Um, and the last thing you mentioned was that authoritarianism can be inefficient. Um, that's why, you know, I actually agree. I mean, that's part of the reason why I'd advocate for democratic structures in the workplace. Uh, my only argument would be that having capital investment um, could actually lead to broader economic efficiencies that are better uh, for all workers. Um, so the first point, the, the first point I made was that uh, the EPA regulations, um, I don't think we can say to a significant extent they've been gutted. Uh, that was if you wanted to start there. I'd say they have been. The EPA is like a laughably weak administration. I don't. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 incredibly weak. I mean, sure. maybe things get better with time, but like, ev like, yeah, it's I, I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't well, think we should be in a position to praise the behavior of any environmental regulation agency when we're continuing to hurdle towards climate disaster. Like the whatever bar there is mm -hmm. for success, they are so far away from it that it's like it's not even yeah. visible. It's over the horizon, well, I guess, or, or past but it's the also atmosphere. It's also not just the EPA, right? We're talking about an entire sort of, um, you know, you'd say worldly failure, but I would say there's there's a lot of uh, hope with regard to environmental regulation um, on, a, on, a, on a world basis, and even in the United States, right? I mean, in the United States, for instance, um, based on our apparently weak, you know, environmental regulation, um, per capita CO2 emissions have been, uh, have decreased uh, since 1973, down 32%. Um, absolute CO2 emissions is the total amount that we emit as an economy has been decreasing since the year uh, 2000 as a broad trend. You, can, you um, can't, and, you can't, wait, I'm sorry. Well, uh, you cannot yeah, go on, go be it. proud of these points when we're missing the scientist projection for mm -hmm. carbon like expansion that would lead to like a 1.5 yeah. degree Celsius increase. Like you, like no, that, you, that was, that was the next thing I was going to say. Right. Yeah. Like this, this isn't enough, you know, like it, it can't be, we can't, yeah. this is not a metric for success. No, no, I, I agree. The, the only point would be to say that I think that it does go against the idea that like the APA has been like slowly degraded over time. Actually, it really hasn't been. And I think that those regulations have been, you know, fairly robust, but the, again, there's an ebb and flow here. That's why what I was going to say, the last point was going to be that the IEA, 
released a they, they release a global energy outlook every single year. Um, the tw obviously the 2021 was the most recent year, um, and uh, they've been tracking environmental progress uh, for I'm not sure how long, probably ever since they started the report. You know, to be honest, but what they found was that based on announced policies, right? So based on the policies that governments have committed to, um, it, it, that we we're going to get about 60 percent of the way to net zero by 2050, and 2050 is the the mark that. I, I have seen broadly as like, this is like when we need to be net zero by. Um, and to be fair, that's not all the way there. That's only 60% of the way there. But that's unless not, we imagine that- That's, yeah, that's yeah. not. Well, unless, well, I was gonna say, unless we imagine that technology is actually not gonna get better at all, better at all, uh, talking about battery storage and carbon capture specifically, and we imagine that number two, policies won't actually become any more aggressive. Um, to be fair, there's no reason to expect that though, because that's been the trend for the last 40 years, right? So With I think respect. that there's a lot of uh, hope with regard no, to the environmental policy. Listening to you gives me the opposite of hope. The complacency that right. you're speaking with right now is exactly why we're in this position. Don't fundamentally change the system. Don't rock the boat. Tech will get better. Things are getting marginally better at a, at a rate. We won't say how quick that rate is. Well, don't, don't neglect the last thing the I said. Though. The last thing I said was that policies, we, we have to assume that also policies won't become more aggressive. Now, I'd advocate for more aggressive environmental policies, right? But I would just say that um, those policies will probably end up happening uh, over time, right? That's And That's... to be fair, we none of, us, none of us can say one thing or another. But what I would just, the last thing, one last sentence was just to say that with regard to, um, yeah, oh, fuck, what was, I, I forgot my last point was, fuck. You fucked I'm, me, Vosh. I'm sure it'll come back. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, go for it. No, we're gambling on the civilization. We can't. This is like, you. oh, well, the EPA has made great progress. We're at a position to reach just over half of the goal of the worst projected outcome scientists set, and maybe policies will change to make up the rest of the shortfall. Like, no, no, like we're, you, we're, we're, we're yeah. barreling down a cliff right now. There's, there's no circumstance in which the system as it is right now, this is tangential nope. because we're talking about worker democracy, but like, I think this, I think this speaks to a fundamental yeah. trust in institutions that liberals have that I don't like, we're, we're talking about the greatest like apocalypse event that has ever definitely been projected to absolutely going to happen in all of human history. I mean, we're talking of global Mount Vesuvius, like a Pompeii to, to, to spread ash across the planet. And it's like, well, sure, Trump put like a coal lawyer on who wiped away a hundred regulations. Trump wouldn't even acknowledge the existence of climate change. And now we have Biden, a guy who can't get through any legislation to fix anything because the Senate is half controlled by Republicans who are all buddy buddies with Murdoch and all of his fuckwit coal and oil friends who all have a material financial incentive. And all of these politicians just happen to own stock and the corporations who they benefit. Like, it, like this, this system is so obviously broken. Like there's such an obvious link between capital ownership and political corruption and doing things that fuck the planet. Um, and I'm yep. not saying that like worker ownership is going to necessarily fix all of these issues, but like we're, we're, we're looking at the most like decrepit system imaginable and, and pontificating whether or not like we want to give democracy a chance. Can you imagine if the founding fathers had done that? Like, um, oh, you know, like we clearly monarchies are bad. So like maybe we should do like kind of a half democracy. Oh, they did. They only let landowning white men vote and they had slaves and it took us 200 years to fix that. I don't want to take 200 years to realize that the problem can't be solved with half measures the way they did. Like that's fundamentally, that's what you're talking about. There's always this hesitance to take that extra step. There are political and economic arguments. Maybe people don't want a full democracy because the average person isn't fully literate and it would assign to them responsibilities they can't handle. Maybe economically slavery is something, a necessary evil, that's a phrase that came up a lot, that we need to contend with, right? But they were wrong. Democracy was always the solution and it was sustainable then as it is now. We can't always kick the can down the road. And in this case, we're not talking about millions of slaves dying every year. That's bad enough. We're talking about billions of people dying soon. And that's just one outcome. I think the fact that collaboration between capital owners leading to the propagation of client science misinfo is all the evidence one would need to scrap capitalism. But like, even even in this shadow, you find hope. And it's a hope, it's a faith in institutions that I just don't have. I, I can't, I, 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 like, I, I don't know any regulation you put forward in the EPA can be rolled back by the next Republican to win. The next time they put a coal lawyer, any education platform you want to put through, all it takes is the next 
private school Betsy Davos billionaire appointed there to roll all of those back. As long as people whose material interests are different to the working class have the ability to seize political power, they will and they'll keep doing it. And they can undo work much faster than we can build things up because destroying is always easier than building. Yeah, I so this kind of does go into the next point. So I would just say that with regard to the whole environmental thing, um, my only my only reason for bringing up those types of those statistics, right, isn't to say that we're doing enough, right? It's 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 really to say the opposite to a certain extent, and then to the broader point that you're making, it's to say that your your broader point is necessarily not the best lens of analysis here. And I think that this is one of the fundamental problems I have with a lot of socialists, right? Which is that um, class interests enable and cause these things, right? These things exist because of these class interests, right? Um, and I think that you know, we wouldn't see any of the things that I just mentioned. We wouldn't see 60% of the way there by 2050 if that was like a broadly correct analysis. We'd see 0% of the way there by 2050 um, in general, right? It, it, my, my faith in the institutions that, you know, we, we have in society, the institution of sort of governing uh, democracy, the institutions of, you know, you could say the EPA is an institution, the institution of just the government in general um, is, is really based on a long history uh, and, you know, an empirical backing of the idea that it tends to be the case that when people vote for a certain thing um, that they, uh, or, or I'm sorry, apologies, when the median voter tends to want a certain thing, they tend to get uh, that certain thing in some form or another. It's not a perfect, uh, you know, system by any means. But I'm not the one saying that one system can all it can solve all of these issues. You know, you mentioned back uh, before in the debate that there are capitalist countries with coal workers and oil workers that have these sort of material interests that don't have the same problem with misinformation with regard to climate change. Again, I agree. Um, capitalist countries can, in fact, deal with that type of information through education campaigns, through things like, um, you know, uh, perhaps regulations on 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 certain topics, and you know how, how you how you might go about that. Who runs the schools? Who in America, yes, cabinet positions appointed by the president are the ones ultimately in charge, and they overwhelmingly choose people of the capital class to make those decisions. Even in those social well, again, democracies, by the way, like yeah, Norway, their welfare systems have been getting gutted over the past few decades as well. Autoc or not autocracy, sorry, austerity and economic liberalization have been hammering away at the um at the the Nordic democracies for a time now. Not as severely as what we have, but you will you'll guess it. It's capital owners doing it. Who's defunding the NHS in the UK? Capital owners. Every time it's them. You build up a castle and watch them tear it down. Because in any country, 99% of the people here are going to be workers. And the most powerful people will be the remaining 1%. And they will be the ones eventually to sink their claws into the systems that we not only use to generate power, but to reaffirm it. It's not enough that they have government. They All they have to do is buy one media company. Bezos bought the Washington Post. Like... And and the Washington Post has since published a number of things um, that are, uh, you know, um, let's say optimistic about the nature of billionaires. Was Bezos telling them to do that? Probably not. But we can never know. There's no way of knowing. And that's scary. That is genuinely concerning. These institutions at any time, and they're always the ones most likely to seize control of them because they have more power. If you're a billionaire, it's more likely you know these politicians, these other people. You can buy into them. Everything is up for sale. And the people capable of buying these systems just don't share the same interests as us. They don't have to. Yeah, but I think that fundamentally what you're getting at in that point is, you know, well, I, I suppose to go a little bit in order, I didn't write it down. I was looking something up. Um, you mentioned that, you know, again, you, you talk about Trump putting a coal lobbyist uh, in the EPA or Betsy DeVos in the Department of Education. Um, you know, again, there, there's an ebb and flow here. I would never say that there's not. I'm really talking about the broad story of America and not, not just America, to be fair. I think it's easy for... Uh, socialists perhaps to look at America and, and say that capitalism itself is the problem, um, when America is fairly unique in a lot of ways. Um, but just to say that I, I think that that narrative is is broadly true over time. Now you might say that well, it's not fast enough, right? We're not we're not reforming these these issues quick enough. Look at climate change; that's the best example perhaps that you can come up with. And and to be fair, it probably is the best example. Um, but what I would say is that again, I, I'm not sure you've properly responded to the idea that all of these material interests would still exist under a cooperatively run economy. There, all of the incentives exist, you know, line for line. Um, and you talk about, you know, the last thing you mentioned that I'll, that I'll respond to is the idea that, you know, billionaires have an outsized influence. Look at that. Capitalism, right? Uh, billionaires being able to buy news media companies. I agree that that can be a problem, but the problem there isn't capital interest. It's not necessarily the capital class because these 
sort of class distinctions would still exist um, under a worker cooperative system. It's just that everyone would be a worker. There'd still be differences in income and wealth. These are the things that really, I think, uh, are potential uh, precarious, uh, uh, sort, sort of, they, they inject precariousness into some of these institutions. I agree. Um, you know, uh, income inequality is a problem, but um, taxes, government oversight, uh, d a democratic government in general um, has shown to very effectively address income inequality and wealth inequality through taxation um, and through these sort of uh, reform uh, and welfare policies. You talk about welfare uh, programs being cut in uh, the Nordic countries. Um, some welfare programs have been cut some of the time, but the broad trend over time is that social spending is going up. Um, we don't see these institutions fundamentally eroding uh, over time. And, and it why? is because of the, it's because, well, last sentence, it's because of that democratic accountability that we agree with. I just think that um, government democratic accountability is good uh, enough. And I think that democratic accountability in the workplace is good, but I think that complete ubiquitous worker uh, democracy um, is not actually uh, good. I think that uh, rather we can have uh, a you know a a, a a a a give and take here between capital and workers that is valuable, um, and I think that a completely democratic government has shown uh, to be fairly robust. That's definitely longer than one sentence. I'm sorry, but has shown a, a robust ability to address these uh, social ills uh, over time. We we will only take and we will not give. Uh, first of all, these social democracies are being eroded. And this give and take that you refer to is an interplay between increasing systemic inequality and general technological advancement. American wealth inequality has been increasing for a century since the New Deal. This is not a slowly increasing thing. Things have been getting worse for a hundred years. They've been getting worse and they will continue to get worse as long as we live in countries where capital owners are capable of making these political decisions. It was capital owners who lobbied, capital owners who wrote those bills, capital owners who brought them to the heads um, of the parties, capital owners that sat them down, capital owners that voted on them, capital owners that promoted everything, always. And the vast majority of the population is the one that suffers the, the, the outcomes of these events. Every time. We, it, like, we, we talk like things are always getting better. Like how? The, the issue is you want a monarchy. You want to make life better for the serfs without getting rid of the king. You say, well, we don't really have an issue with the king necessarily. We can find ways to have social democracy. We can find ways to have, you know, high like rates of, uh, you know, education and literacy and such. But the problem with monarchs is that they don't let you do that. It's, it's not enough to pontificate. I think if anything, your system is the idealist one. Like mine is the realistic one. You're talking about building a dam uh, while the river continues to flow. I'm talking about stopping the river. You're talking about building a system antithetical to the interests of the capital class while the capital class are still in charge of everything. And I'm saying we don't need them. We can build alternative systems. I have responded to these points. What the differences are in material interest. Transparency makes a critical distinction, as does internal accountability. How likely a whistleblower is to be fired, how much you can speak out without being quietly shunned from the industry. Um, and additionally, you'd be advocating only for the interests of your business, not for the capital class as a broader institution, which they consistently do. Which is why you see, of course, members of the capital class always act in tandem. I say always here, of course, I'm exaggerating, but they overwhelmingly do. They have class interests. They're class conscious. They know what they're doing. They know what they want. They know what their interests are. They disagree sometimes on cultural issues, but like, if you take a look at like the ultra wealthy in this country, you will not see a representative split of different political like beliefs. You know, you're not going to see the same like 30, 40, 30 red independent blue split that you would get down the line for the average working person. You're not going to see the same split on tax issues or on land owning issues or in anything related to workers or regulation or anything like that. You know, there is clearly a distinction. That is true. There are countries that are capitalist um, that don't have all the problems that we have here in America, but they have some of them. And other countries that aren't America have problems that we don't have. And it's always the same group responsible. I, just because all problems aren't present everywhere doesn't mean there isn't a shared cause. We can fix it, but we have to work in the absence of the uber powerful group of people who want the opposite of what the average citizen wants. We need to get rid of the ability to grow powerful through ownership. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, when I say you haven't responded, what I obviously, I mean, you, you, you said things that 
we're in we're countering what I'm saying. I mean, obviously, that's true. I'm just saying that I'm not sure it. We 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 we've we've fully connected the two. You know, the idea that um, being able to buy ownership in a company causes all these uh, problems. The idea that there wouldn't be the same sort of uh, sort of similar class distinction. Obviously, if we're talking in a you know sort of socialist or you know maybe Marxian sense, you know the the strict definition of bourgeois versus worker, there would not be that distinction. But again, there would still be these uh, wealth distinctions. You know, you talk about worker cooperatives as a much. means to perhaps alleviate some of this inequality. Um, I think that. Um, you know, worker cooperatives have been shown to alleviate some al amount of firm level inequality, um, you know, f 15, 25 percent of it, maybe. Um, but we're not talking about this huge amount of uh, this incredible reduction of inequality because of the cooperative wait, organization. Hold on. Um, and I would just say, wait, 15 yeah, to 20 percent. How? Because the difference between average pay of a worker and a CEO and a co-op is fractionally smaller than the difference in the average pay of a traditional worker and traditional CEO. Yeah, the, the the analysis that I saw was comparing, uh, you know, re uh, apologies. The, the analysis that I was saw was comparing like to like, right? It was comparing similar cooperatives to similar traditionally managed firms. Now, uh, obviously, if, if you don't want to talk empirics, that's fine, but it's going to be pretty difficult for you to. We we would have to just imagine the empirics because there's not been like a broad amount of. Uh, you know, I, I suppose there's not been a broad amount of, uh, you know, large cooperatives that have been adopted literally uh, anywhere, um, even in the most sort of cooperatively dense uh, regions in the world. Um, but in general, it, what they've shown is that there's still a, a relative amount of inequality um, within those types of systems. Now, and that's my only point, really, with regard to a lot of the points that you just made is that um, I agree that there's precariousness with income inequality. Income inequality has a lot of uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, extrapolations uh, from it that are negative uh, for society. My only point would be that taxes and uh, democratic government have shown an ability to tackle that issue. Um, one of the books that I read, I might be interpreting this graph wrong to be fair, has shown that income inequality based on several indices has actually been flat uh, over time. Um, and between a country inequality, right, the relative sort of inequality between country A and B has actually been uh, decreasing since 1990, right? And so, you know, th those are valuable statistics because I think what it shows is that, um, you know, you might say that inequality in country A or B might be going up or down, but I'm talking about the broadest possible trend, the broadest samplings that we have. Um, it's been relatively static or decreasing uh, over time, uh, talking about in-country versus out-of-country inequality. And I think that every study that I've looked at has shown that taxes are a, a valuable way to address uh, that inequality. Um, and they don't, well, you might say that they're motivated and why they don't recommend this. They don't re typically recommend worker cooperatives as a means to solve that issue because taxes have a more aggregative effect. Um, they're more efficient probably than implementing this type of structure. Um, they're more redistributive in nature. Um, and honestly, they probably just straight up lead to um, more directly less inequality than worker cooperatives because there's still not a distinction between non-workers and workers, workers at cooperative A versus B. If you get a flat benefit, you get a flat benefit. If you're taxed, you're taxed, right? Um, and you might argue for those same systems. I'm just saying that those systems seem to effectively address the problems that you're talking about. Um, whereas I'm not sure, you, obviously you cannot demonstrate that worker cooperatives would solve these issues. We can only sort of uh, speculate, but I, I give you that, that that's, you know, that's probably an advantage in my favor, not in yours, but that's not because I've done any extra work in that regard. That's just how it is. Um, but in general though, I just, I just don't think that you've presented, I don't think you've presented to me a convincing reason why um, these problems um, empirically haven't been able to be solved um, or in the future could not be solved under a democratic, but also um, a democratic government framework with a capitalist uh, economic framework, especially when, again, I feel like we also haven't gotten an adequate response to the idea that um, the transparency benefits, which seems to be a lot of the things that uh, you're, you're sort of hinging on, you know, these sorts of benefits, the, you know, the worker, um, you, you know, worker board membership unionization, that wh why we couldn't solve those types of issues with worker board membership and unionization. You keep talking about class interest and, 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 and the interest itself, but I'm breaking down that class interest. I think similarly to you are, I'm just trying to use tools that have been proven to be effective, um, not ones uh, that necessarily haven't been proven to be effective um, on an aggregate level. I think a mandate is where you end okay. up running into all these problems. So a few things. First of all, Go for it. income inequality is at very high levels. Global income inequality might have decreased because the aggregate is averaging out. Industrialization in developing countries is bringing them up a little bit more to par in a sort of relativistic way. In terms of like relative wealth inequality in this country, it is historically high. I know there's some variable fluctuation there, but you're talking about it. It's like basically the worst, like in human history. No, 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 but, but can I, let, wait, wait, let me wait, jump, wait, wait, let me jump on, in. Wait, so, but some of the stuff that you said is just, like, isn't true. You saying that okay. th there's a 15 to 20 percent decrease in inequality from like firms to like firms. The average ratio of pay from a worker to a CEO in America is one to 400 or so. 
co-ops have nowhere near that. They're not 15% lower, which I think would be, what, 345 or something? Three, three something. They're not 20% lower, which would be like 320 to 1. They're massively lower. I don't know what metric would be used for that, but obviously whatever kind of worker cooperative I would advocate for would have a fairly flat income level. Also, nothing I'm talking about here is in any way antithetical to a good tax policy. Um, they're you know, com completely compatible with each other. Um, the issue is like, you're asking me, why can't my systems work? I ask you, why haven't they been implemented? I acknowledge the reason why my big mandate hasn't happened yet is because it's against the interests of the most powerful people on earth. We must force them to do it. However necessary, we must force them to. But what you're suggesting is that within the system, through incentive and through, you know, um, management, like we should, we should advocate for what this, you know, worker controls half, you know, higher tax rates. Well, then why isn't that happening? Every country on earth in the West right now developing uh, capitalist countries, developed capitalist countries, where is this, this tremendous uh, social democracy then? We had some of them because there was a post-war boom and we saw when manufacturing was done locally, and usually, of course, you know, you have countries that have disproportionately um, a, a good welfare states. There's usually some kind of internal economic supplement. Norway has their oil, of course, the Social Wealth Fund. Uh, Sweden has been gutted over the past 40 years. The UK was never that good to begin with, and now capital interests are selling off bits of the NHS. I'm pointing to a system, a series of problems, and you're asking me where the evidence is that they're causing the problem. The capital owners are as inseparable from the problems of today as the monarchs of the 14th century European kingdoms were. You cannot remove them. You cannot give them half power. The Magna Carta did not end monarchy. And keeping slavery in a democracy does not fundamentally address the necessary co-balance between economic needs and the right to people, um, to people's ownership of the systems they live within. You have to cut the problem off at the head, metaphorically. With this... <laughs> We took metaphorically in a video game. We we t we talk about in these systems, game. right? Of course, but like we live in a ludicrously inequitable system. Climate disaster, which is undeniably caused by um, the behavior of either the capital class or those um, those directly linked to it, um, uh, is 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 barreling down at us. Um, I I just don't understand. He, like here are the counter arguments to me. Right? Um, we might yep. have some difficulty acquiring uh, capital invest or like proper investment structures when you have this big cooperative mandate. Like that's it, you know? Worker cooperatives are quite effective in some respects and neutral in many others. We don't seem to have a lot of information suggesting they're like distinctly worse in fields, which is why I advocate for more testing research. We have to get more data. Um, we, um, it, it's, it's, it, and my, my arguments against you here are that Every problem that we suffer right now is directly tied to one particular group of people. And the reason they're able to propagate these issues is a direct product of the nature of the class relationship between them and working people. There is a huge difference between an owner of a corporation and a person who is a worker who is elected to its top. There is an incredible difference between those two things. And we know that because we know there's a difference between an authoritarian and a democratic government. There are corporations that have more employees right now than some small city states did back in, you know, the Middle Ages. And we can see perfectly well um, then that there were consequences to autocratic management. I just, I don't see how these transpose. It's a kind of economic conservatism. The belief that, oh, democracy was a fine experiment then, but, well, now we're done with it. I don't see why we should be done with it, especially when the arguments against my position are essentially uh, capital um, acquisition might be difficult. You know, we can work on ways to handle that. I still think that non-controlling shares would be a fine solution if you just got rid of the stock market. We've done it before. It's not like we couldn't do it again. And And, and on your side, it's like, well... The EPA is doing fine, you know, we'll invent new technology to fix climate change. Like every developed country on earth could have had like a good like social welfare system this whole time, but for some reason they don't have it. It has nothing to do with the capital class running the media and running the government. Like you understand it's, it's, it, this isn't, and this isn't a product of conspiracy. You know, these people wear it on their chests. You vote for a politician. You know perfectly well which corporations they used to work on the board of. You know perfectly well who they're friends with because we have transparency. It's a democratic country. We wouldn't know if it was some, you know, um, fully authoritarian shithole. Uh, another benefit there, I think. 
Um, it, it's not conspiracism. We've gotten rid of political classes before. We eliminated the monarchy. I don't. I think this is a realistic approach. We must block off the water before we can build the dam. Yeah. So yeah, to, to respond to a little bit of these points, I think I think we get into um, well. Yeah, I just go into it basically. So um, you talk about, you know, why hasn't your system been implemented? Where, where is this sort of worker, uh, so, you know, social democracy, worker democracy that I'm talking about? Um, you know, almost every country in Europe has worker board membership, sectoral bargaining, um, you know, relatively robust workers' rights and and, and representation uh, with regard to disputes between uh, them and, and capital owners. Um, and not to mention, like I said, a seat at the table if they have worker board membership and, and unionization. So, I mean, you know, again, you mentioned previously in this debate that not all countries have the problem with, you know, climate denial, as an example, you mentioned not all countries have the same problems um, everywhere, but that doesn't mean there isn't sort of a broad apparatus of issues. Well, I, I do think it's sort of, um, it, it, it's weird because I feel like you're, it's almost like you're using the holes in the narrative to, to, to prove the narrative itself, right? Um, that that doesn't mean that there's necessarily not a broad uh, sort of uh, apparatus uh, of issues in this regard. Um, I think it actually does disprove that. I think what it proves is that a capitalist system under a regulatory framework that's democratically decided, um, in fact, does have uh, a, a heck of an ability to uh, determine the flows uh, of society and, and, and where we move. Um, I oh. think you get into a straw man. Uh, well, exactly. That's what I was about to mention. You know, I think you get into a straw man of my argument when you talk about how, um, you know, your your oh, uh, action's not really required. The environmental policy's fine, right? The EPA's great. These welfare pr programs are doing just fine. Um, unequal exchange, whatever. You know, we'll reform out of it. Why don't they have their welfare? They'll get it eventually. Um, I'm not actually saying that. I'm saying we actually do need a fair amount of policy to address these things. What I'm defending is the why, idea that wait, policy wait, wait. itself. Why yeah, would that policy get passed? So I would argue that that policy would get passed. Well, when you say that policy, there's a broad set of things I just mentioned. Those policies, I think, in general would get passed if people, apologies, if people generally uh, would support them and vote for representatives to do so. Um, I think that I've adequately responded to the idea that people are just simply almost like cogs in a machine, just manufactured consent all the way to the but moon. Again, we wouldn't see, well, just one second. Why we wouldn't see any participation of... died off here in America? Well, well, I can't, but what you're saying is demonstrably yeah. wrong. Like it's not. It, no, it, it it is. Like the, what people know about these complicated economic issues is going to be supplied to them from powerful institutions. Unions objectively made people's lives better here in the states, and now union membership is at record lows. Clearly, there's not a correlation, at least not a strong one, between. Actually, I will say this: there is a correlation between what voters want um, and what gets voted in, but there doesn't seem to be a correlation always between what's good for voters and what gets voted in because people want the right to work, right? I mean, people want a lot of things that end up being pretty bad for them, right? Because all the, the media promotes it. They say it's fine. The Republicans come out there and they say, you know, Democrats are doing socialism by doing infrastructure bills, you know, like in, in this environment entirely fueled by capital interests, like, like clearly it's not like Europe sucks. They're like marginally better. They have cooler buildings, I guess. Like, oh. is, is that the win? Like, they're they're barely any better than we are. They're like ten years down the line uh, from where we are, I guess. Maybe. I really disagree. I, I I but hold on, no, I, I I really disagree with a lot of the the premises stated here. So, I think that um with, with regard to union membership, right in the United States, you know, I think we peaked out about 30, 40 percent. I don't even, I don't think it was thirty percent. I think it was around thirty percent unionization back in the seventies. Um, was about where the United States peaked out. Now we're about down to ten percent. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, and you, and to be fair, like, obviously I, I hear you maybe Googling it, Google it. I, I think that that is the, the correct, uh, answer. Um, and to be fair, that is a decrease, right? Going from 30% to 10%. Now we've got about half of people represented by public unions and private unions have sort of gone away. You know, that is a problem, but I'm not sure that's a problem that necessarily is borne out in every single country. Um, in a lot of countries, union membership has declined, but you know, for instance, in uh, Europe, they don't have right to work laws in Europe, right? You're not, uh, oftentimes you're not, or I'm sorry, they have basically the equivalent of right to work laws in uh, Europe, right? From what I was able to do, and I'm happy to be corrected on that. That's just what I was able to read was that um, there's a similar sort of ability to not actually do, uh, you know, basically be a part of a union, but work at a company in European countries as there is in many uh, GOP run states today. It's not to say that right to work is good. It's just to say that the propensity for an economy to um, really broadly adopt unionization is probably less dependent on the relationship fundamentally between capitals and capital owners and workers. And it's probably more so based on how stringent government policy is, how transparent the democratic structure of their government is, um, and, uh, you know, how, frankly, just policy. 
So as I've said throughout this entire time, I think that it was, what is, it, well, really quick, the, the last thing that I was going to respond to, and I'll, and I'll respond to that uh, after this, is that um, I don't think we could say that, you know, the, the, I don't think we could say that the people of the Nordic economies or like Western Europe face a, a marginally better circumstance than the United States. There is a heck of a, of a difference between the workers of America and the workers of those countries, what they face and what we face. Um, I think there is a big difference there. Now, with regard to your question, who controls, who sort of determines how that policy gets passed? Um, you know, initially the voters do, right? I think that, again, there is evidence that pretty much the median voters' uh, wishes are often represented or pretty much always represented in government. There's a, there's actually a specific analysis released that um, analyzed voter preferences with regard to welfare spending specifically, almost like the exact question that we're talking about. And what it showed was that in the short run, um, you know, political parties and like party interests can have um, some effects, right? Similar to what we're both saying here, that sometimes you might see welfare spending decrease. You might see the NHS get cut. You might see social assistance be scaled back, right? So whatever it might be. Um, you might see social security get scaled back, right? But what it also found was that over the long run, voter preferences essentially entirely dictated welfare spending um, in the country. Um, and I don't think that uh, it's, 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 I don't think one, it's been demonstrated that this manufacturing consent issue is broadly true. The narrative makes sense, but I think that there's a lot of uh, dynamics at play that are hard to account for. And then I, I, I don't think we can say that just because we don't have capital owners, all of these same incentives that Chomsky would talk about wouldn't necessarily exist. Now, I don't want to speak for Chomsky. Frankly, he'd probably obviously uh, disagree with me. I'm not sure what he would say in this regard, but all of those things, we went line by line on manufacturing consent. Every single one of those things would still apply to a market socialist system. And the transparency gains of, uh, you know, of, of, of cooperative ownership would still uh, exist with okay. worker board members. Worker board members would have all of the same rights to company information um, and management processes as any other uh, member of the board. So I, I think that uh, there's there's a lot of holes in this narrative, and I don't think that we can say definitively that capital owners need to be excised uh, from the system. You're right. Now, the last thing I was going to say, I keep saying that. You do is keep that saying you're right. that, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm sorry. I, just, I swear to God, just cut me off in two sentences. Okay. Um, you're right that... Um, uh, fuck, I forgot. Go on, go for it. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, okay, there's no holes in the narrative at all. Unions make life better for workers. Business owners lie about unions destroying their businesses as they have complained about every kind of regulation and countermeasure against businesses for hundreds of years. They go to the news stations. Those narratives are promoted. People vote in people with austere or opposite economic interests. The common strategy right now, actually, is don't directly address the economic issues, but shoot any of them down by saying that they're woke. Tie them to cultural issues. Who was it? Josh Hawley, who said that Biden's Build Back Better plan was too woke because it would address climate change, and climate change is for pink-haired social justice warriors. Like, and, and, you know, if you take a look at who Josh Hawley is buddy buddies with and how much money he's got every time, man, listen, Europe is not that much better off than we are. They get like healthcare. They're a capitalist country. They're capitalist countries. The welfare state has been dismantled in Sweden and in the process of dismantling. Um, Denmark is not that good for poor people, though they have expanded benefits for their shrinking middle class. The UK was never that great, and the NHS has been torn up. And there is a direct relationship between austerity politics and the voters' interests. You see this with the Blairites back when they were doing their labor run in the UK. They talk about the need to tighten our belts, and people start voting as though money isn't something the government can literally print. And then all of a sudden you have all these welfare programs cut. The Grinsfeld Tower, uh, you know, burnt because, um, uh, uh, you know, the fat, like, what was it? Thatcher deregulated the system by which these buildings were like overseen. And then you had them cheaping out on like the insulation material and then it all caught fire or whatever. Like there are, there are direct consequences, immediate consequences to, to this, um, this this promotion and what i'm talking about right now is not like some crazy big brain socialist like idealist take or whatever this is like very straightforward application of basic like um not even theory just like what the media does the media promotes interests that are beneficial to the media the people in charge of the media have a disproportionate weight on what they consider their interests to be they're overwhelmingly wealthy capital owners so if they're buddy buddies with other wealthy capital owners they form collaborative narratives that end up benefiting them if you take a look at like news media over the past century you will find a litany of misinformation promoted by business interests not just for the individual business though 
for all businesses, a constant attack on labor and labor rights, on regulation, on workplace enforcement, on the ability for workers to regulate or to manage or to whistleblow, constant. And if and if 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 there was true democracy, if these, you know, the news was news and people were voting in favor of their own interests, we would have like 98% union representation right now. Hyperbolic, but I'll go with it, you know. The, the, all these issues, like if people really voted for what they wanted and what they wanted was really good for them, we would have socialized healthcare empirically better than what we have here in the States. We would have full union participation. We would have like a litany of workers' right laws that we don't have. But the history of workers' rights in this country is a history of blood. Everything from banning child labor to uh, establishing a five-day work week to overtime is something people fought for and they fought against people. They fought against business owners who sent the government in Pinkertons. They fought against planes that bombed their mining camps. The idea that this class antagonism went from literal bloodshed to, oh, it's just a trade relationship, you know? Oh, we're just, but we both have opposite interests and we negotiate to find what's mutually beneficial is ridiculous and it's naive. That is not what happened. Things got less explicitly violent in the States. We kill plenty of people abroad, Coca-Cola, death squads, Columbia, et cetera, et cetera. The fundamental relationship has maintained its, um, uh, uh, you know, severity. It's just gotten quieter. And we have to, we can't pretend that's not the case. It's always them. It's always the capital owners. I feel I've addressed the, how would things be different under a cooperative thing? Uh, if, if you disagree, that's fine. I, I'm working from a position right now where I feel like there's a very strong historical incentive to do away with this class as we did away with the monarchy. Um, and and the, 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 the obstacle that I have to overcome is let's sort out the, the investment thing, you know? And I feel like that's a pretty easy hurdle to get over. Cooperatives still preserve the fundamental productivity of the enterprise. All the money still exists. The money hasn't gone anywhere, you know? People can loan um, money as banks or credit unions if they want. Or if they want to do a proper investment, there are non-controlling shares. You can put in so and so much money and hope that it ends up being worth more in the long run. Um, it, it, these systems work, you know? And maybe right now those aren't attractive because why invest in a non-controlling share when controlling shares are the norm? But, you know, why uh, hire um, regular workers when you can hire undocumented people? You pay one third under the table. Why hire like a white man when you can hire a slave to work your plantation? You know, why have like, you know, paid freemen when you can use serfs? Like that's always the question, isn't it? It's always going to be more efficient to exploit. But we fix that by killing the people who exploit. Uh, uh, full stop. <laughs> Metaphorically. <laughs> Metaphorically. <laughs> yes. Yes. In a video game. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I get what you're saying. I think again, to, to resp I, I think that what you haven't responded to in this regard is is you know is the empirical argument, right? I think that this is where I, I, the, the narrative really starts to deconstruct itself, right? Um, you know, you, you talk about you know, again, I, I I do say the narrative makes sense, right? It's just the empirics that tend to tend to you know kick kick out of the, kick the narrative out of out of being factual, right? So you know, for instance, you talk about. Uh, the NHS being cut, sort of, you know, vaguely the NHS is being cut. Not that it's not. You haven't referenced anything specific. You talked about the same thing in, in Sweden. Again, you know, broadly, these societies have increased social welfare over time, right? You haven't how responded so? to the idea that there's, there's, how so? Well, I mean, part of it is, a lot of it is increased uh, retirement spending for elderly people. A lot of it is increased healthcare spending as well. A lot of it's an expansion of unemployment. Uh, benefits, right? What have you? Um, it's also hard uh, because some societies, like you know, you might look at as a uh, like the Netherlands or recently. As a well, again, you're putting so many caveats. So you as a percentage of GDP, me. the answer is you chastise me for being vague, but that's important. If we go back a hundred no, 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 years, I, then yes, the welfare states expanded since then. But I mean, well, given... I just I just gave several examples though. I mean, and I also I, when since I say caveats, 80s? what I mean is like. Like the 80s was when like well, the whole neoliberal yes. like austerity, you know, deregulate, you know, cut, cut, cut thing really kicked into yeah. into shape. So I'm just making sure we're operating at a proper time frame here. I know Sweden's has significant, you know, cuts. Yeah. I know the NHS has. I know Denmark's had some weird shifts. Um, 
Yeah, since the answer is that the answer is yes. Since the '80s, as a proportion of our economy, we tend to you know distribute more in terms of taxation and also spend more in terms of social spending. Um, and when I say putting caveats, I you, you talk about recently. It depends on your window, obviously. Um, recently, obviously, we've we've spent a shitload more money on on social welfare because of COVID. Um, I'm not sure if you'd give me the credit in that regard, but that is you know that is broadly true. It's 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 absolutely true that we've spent a lot more on social welfare. Um, you know, the most recently that we can look at. Um, you know, and again, you might have a a socialist analysis for why we would do that. I'm not really sure. Um, you know, in general, though, I, I would just agree that some power. of these. Well, I think that it does, though, right? Because if you have a generous welfare state to fall back on and your boss is treating you like shit, you know, you absolutely have the ability to say, you know, no, frictionally, I'm going to unemploy myself so that I can get on this welfare, get another job, right? Um, it's the same reason why people would say that a UBI would increase the negotiating power of workers because they have more of an income back to negotiate to with their, these their workers back. afloat. I mean, we had the PPP loans, of course, but also the main reason why, like, a, a bunch of these COVID, like, um, supplementary, like, welfare things took place um, w w was simply because it's necessary for maintaining basic economic functionality. That's what we're talking about right now, you know? Uh, the CDC no, cut no, no, the... No, 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 uh, no, I know, and I... I... Yeah. I don't want to get into... Because again, with COVID, that, so I, I agree, not, you, you, that's not you, you probably power. wouldn't give me credit. Yeah, yeah, it no, doesn't no, give I, us more power of, of the world, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I said I, I agree. You, you probably wouldn't give me credit on the on a, all the social welfare spending related to COVID, right? That's why I'm just saying that if it depends on your time frame, if you're talking 80s, 90s, the answer is yes, we spend as a proportion of our economy more on social welfare since then. And when I say we, I mean in aggregate. Again, you can probably look at specific countries that have made reforms that spend less, um, but then I would probably just appeal to perhaps quality of life. We can take a more contextual analysis if you want, um, but we're having a broader discussion. So I'm not sure it makes sense to look at specific countries when we're having a broader discussion about the entire mode and means of production of our society, right? Um, I don't think it makes sense at that point to say, um, you know, look at the UK cutting their welfare spending, right? That's an example, or cutting their NHS spending, right? That's, an, that's a reason why we need to get rid of capital um, interest. Those are decent enough examples, but I don't think that they're good enough to overcome the broad empirical truth that social spending has indeed uh, increased. Um, and, you know, you, you, the, la you know, in, the last just thing you talked thing, about just, is... Just one yeah, thing. Go on. Keep in mind, social spending isn't the goal for me. It's worker control. Um, even a system in which you had a perfect yeah. welfare state, which was, you could, like, like I said, you could have a country, which is a monarchy with no democracy, where you have a perfect welfare state, and I would still hate that country. Democracy is non-negotiable. You can have a welfare well, state that doesn't you, confer control to the working class. Sometimes it can placate them. That's kind of a common, like, yeah. cyberpunk theme. Well, but, but you said earlier in the debate, though, that you actually didn't believe that, right? As far as I understood, the way, what you said earlier in the debate was that if it could be proven that this society would be so materially worse off, you actually wouldn't, you'd probably shift your beliefs at that point. Is, is that not true or is that true? Like society collapsing. How, oh, out of curiosity, how bad, how non-functioning would democracy have to be for you to want to live under like a, uh, you know, like a Kazakhstan or like a Saudi Arabian type government? Like how much better would they, like if, for mm -hmm. instance, if they could provide like, a greater proportion of their national budget towards um, welfare stuff on a, in accordance with, um, yeah. you know, a, a greater efficiency conferred through authoritarianism, mm -hmm. and they also had a more robust economy. Would you prefer that? Uh, no, I wouldn't, because I, I do fundamentally value democracy and civic society, right? I'm just, the reason I asked you the question is because it seems like you're making contradictory statements where you're saying, on one hand, you're saying, you know, I don't give a shit how perfect a society is without democracy, I would still want democracy. But then in the, in the beginning of the debate, you said, I actually very much give a shit how, how like materially wealthy society is, so I might not actually be in favor of worker democracy if it could be proven that it was so bad. If it's so these, an these statements seem to be but there's totally no evidence contradictory. That there, well, there's, I, I said if there's an enormous distinction, just that it's not my focus. Yeah. Right now, there's no evidence of any distinction because worker cooperatives either outperform traditional firms or in a lot of cases, they simply yeah. perform like neutrally. Um, it's like very, no, 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 I, I get that. I, I, and, and I would appeal to the empirical argument as well, but I'm saying you, you didn't make empirical arguments on either end of the debate. You, you said principally, I do believe in democracy. I don't care how like materially well off a monarchist system is. Um, but, but then at the beginning, you said principally, I believe in democracy, but only up to a certain point. And the, these things don't seem to... Can you explain the distinction or, or do you want to amend one of the statements? I mean, if you if you had like a if there was a system or a set of material conditions where you could have democracy, but it would mean everyone's like, you know, killing dogs for scrap to, to eat in like a <laughs> sure, in like yeah. junkyards or whatever. Like, I guess I, I guess like a strong man who could make everything right might be an appealing like idea right then. But I don't think that's the divide we're dealing with. I'm only saying that there's a difference between worker control 
which is what I care about. And I think that will necessarily ferment benefits. Like the system I'm advocating for right now is capable of doing everything you're advocating for. And I don't think there are any downsides to the implementation of my system over yours. And we get to get rid of the bourgeois in my system. Because everything you say we could do with half board membership or, you know, whatever parcel, half measure or whatever, you could certainly do under my system because I'd be far more aggressive about it. But you can also fix mm -hmm. problems that you couldn't, uh, problems I'm ascribing to the bourgeois as a class, which I imagine categorically you're going to disagree with due to a different ideological framework. But I think that looking at history yep. and looking at the world today, there is extremely strong evidence that the history of the world is a history of class struggle and that the easiest and best way to resolve the antagonisms brought about by that conflict is to make sure there is only one class, the working class. And that should be the uh, only controlling group of, uh, of any country, uh, a proletarian state. <clears throat> Well, I think, I, you know, I, I think that um, outside of, you know, what I would say, the last thing that I would say, and perhaps it's a good, it's a good uh, stopping point for the debate, because we might be going in circles at this point, um, would be to say that, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. I've, I've enjoyed the conversation. Um, the last thing that I would say in this regard is that um, I, I would actually say the exact same thing about your system, right? Is that, you know, all the benefits conferred by your system, I think would be solved uh, for in my system. I think that if you actually appeal to the historical um, uh, you know, analysis and argument. I think uh, that what we do see um, is that uh, there is oftentimes conflict between capital owners uh, and workers. Um, however, uh, there's there's oftentimes conflict with regard uh, to trade. I think that this is an example that um, kind of underpins the way that I view um, the relationship between capital and owners. Um, it's a trade, right? Uh, workers are trading um, part of their surplus labor value um, for ease of access to capital uh, for a higher wage than they'd probably otherwise be able to garner if they did it on their own, if they started their own business. It is a trade. Now, that's not to say that trade can't be coercive. Of course, trade can be coercive, right? If the United States says, you know, hey, Bermuda, uh, I'm going to nuclear bomb your island unless you give me all of your money, right? That's obviously a coercive relationship, but that's where rules are in place to try and prevent that type of incredible coercion uh, from happening in the first place. Um, I think coercion fundamentally is uh, some sort of a problem with trade relationships and with the relationship oftentimes between workers and employees. There can be coercion, there can be uh, monopsony power there, there can be market failures there. But I think that what's been proven over time uh, is that uh, not only are typically institutions strengthening over time, um, they're strengthening because of the, de of the democratic say uh, that uh, individual people have in their governments. Governments have proven an ability to regulate these types of things, right? Um, I think that if, if broadly it was true, your narrative, um, on one hand, we've got you know, this this powerful uh, capitalist class that's able to um, basically manufacture consent, control the government, control the government. Um, on one hand, this is true. Um, but then on the other hand, we've got all of these systems um, not only being funded more than they were otherwise, not only having more redistribution, oftentimes higher tax burdens over time, because not only has social uh, spending gone up, so has taxes as a percent of GDP, right? So why would the capitalist class allow this massive redistribution of wealth uh, not only to happen, but to increase uh, over time? Um, and I think that if you appeal to history, um, that is what you get. Um, and that's why I'd advocate for my system. I feel like your system has the downsides that I mentioned of this sort of structural finance problem, economic growth, probably economic mobility as well. Um, but my system has uh, a lot of the same, uh, if not all the same benefits uh, of yours. That would be, uh, you know, that, that's kind of what I would say to, to close it out. Well, the nice thing about uh, both of our systems is that it's probably going to be a while before we find divergent paths, right? Yeah, I think that ultimately that that is something that the market socialists and the social democrats of the world can certainly agree on is that um you know we might probably fundamentally be on the same road right it's just that um you know i might be done after you know a, a, after a 10k uh, whereas you might want to run the full marathon right <laughs> not <laughs> but, with this body you know we, but yeah that's the goal oh, um, well, we've got a lot of fair. work to do with get, with getting um with getting evidence on you know, the implementation of this stuff. I would like to see more instances of sort of incremental worker ownership applied to get more data from it. Um, but ideologically, there is an irreconcilable difference. Um, maybe time will change people's perspectives on this. I guess we'll see. Okay. And uh, I've, got some, I've got some closing questions for you. Hit me. Okay. Um, when are you going to go on the well-known and popular and 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 not infamous but but extraordinary podcast known as alcoholics hosted by kyo sun and specter um i've been on a podcasting bent lately let me see alcoholics 
Uh, is, it, is that a second O or a second I? Oh, I see, second I. Okay, let's see. Terrain and cream makes... You know, I think I'd be really bad at this because I've gotten drunk, like, maybe three times in the past year. I feel like, um, I feel like I have to do some, some studying. Yeah. Drinking is, is not a, a strict requirement and I'm, I'm not part of the show. They just, uh, they, uh, they were sure to ask, you know, Oh, ask Vosh to, to, oh, to should, come on they, our show. If um, they email me, I, I love popping on people's podcasts. Usually I just do it on my days off. Like, cause they record locally. Uh, yeah. All right. You heard it there. Uh, Kayo and inspector just email Vosh to be fair. That's how, uh, that's how I got, uh, to, to debate Vosh a couple times. Um, and, uh, uh, the, the second uh, question that I had is, uh, can I, uh, tell the people to subscribe to me? Yeah, yeah of course. Absolutely. I've All actually right. seen a couple well, of your every... debates on the aforementioned off days. Yeah, well, that's, you know, you, you heard it there, folks. Uh, Vosh, number one Econoboy fan watching, uh, watching my debates offline. You know, that is actually, that does mean a lot because I'm sure that uh, you don't, uh, similar to like other content creators, like, you know, I'm, I'm sure you, you probably don't watch a lot of streams or content uh, yourself necessarily. Um, so that, that, that does actually mean something. So if, you know, if anyone's interested, um, I am a filthy social Democrat and a capitalist, uh, but like Vosh said, uh, we, we do agree fundamentally on many policies. So if you're interested in a policy analysis uh, that I do, I debate conservatives, I debate socialists, uh, and I do a lot of sort of, you know, just generic sort of economic uh, discussions. I'm actually doing a video on social wealth funds, which um, you know, most capitalists and socialists can oftentimes, uh, you know, end up liking. Uh, and that video is probably going to be about 15 or 20 minutes long or something like that. Just talking about what social wealth funds are. That's an example of the type of informative content uh, that I Sub do. So Left keeps telling me to learn about social wealth funds. And every time I look at the page that he linked me like a year ago, my eyes bla glaze over. So maybe that'd be a good way for me to learn as well. <laughs> you don't, you don't, uh, I guess, uh, you're, you're not as interested in social wealth funds. Is that it? Uh, it's, it's, um, it's not as bloody. Now, it doesn't confer the kind of worker control I get hard over. Um, but no, for, no, it does, it does look well, good. It, do, it does look good. Yeah. I'm being, I'm being, um, uh, uh, uh contention. I'm, I'm being antagonistic right now. Yes, they do look nice. Well, I don't know. I mean, could, could I ask you about that though? Uh, about what I get hard over or about, uh, social well, wealth not funds? <laughs> No, about, uh, yeah, about, well, really about Norway specifically, because, mm -hmm. you know, I actually think you could, and I'm not a socialist to be fair, but I think you could actually make, um, so let me, let me, let me caveat this. If your requirement of socialism is that there need, there, there cannot be any capital ownership, Norway does not qualify as a socialist country. Um, however, um, if you view socialism as more of a spectrum, like many do, right, where you can either be more socialist or more capitalist or in between somewhere in there. Um, I think there's actually a very strong argument that Norway is functionally a socialist economy in many respects. Um, can I give you a few of those respects and see what your reaction is? Go for it. Okay, so number one, 40% uh, of the GDP is collected and distributed in the form of taxation under a democratic framework. So that's uh, nearly half the economy right there. Um, in, a, in 2020, government spending as a percent of the GDP was a majority of the economy. Um, around 60% of country wealth is collectivized with the uh, social wealth fund. If you don't include household wealth, um, like house wealth, um, that goes up to 76%. Um, this is in addition to uh, around 30% of the Oslo uh, stock market is uh, actually owned by the government, either in the form of state-owned enterprises or their domestic social wealth fund. Um, and a, uh, a majority of people are represented by unions. Two-thirds of employees are covered by collective bargaining agreements. I mean, would, that's, that sounds like a fairly collectivized economy to me. That sounds nice, but there are still two economic classes, right? It's, it's, it's just, it's one of those, it's one of those supplemental things where I guess in terms of socialism for me, it's, People talk about socialism like it's an economic ideology, but the more I think about it, the more I feel like that might be misplaced. It's a political ideology with economic prerequisites. And I feel like at the, at the end of the day, as long as capital ownership persists, the fundamental power differential between the two classes will be maintained. Though, of course, the, the social welfare um, is, is an admirable goal. America sucks quite a bit more than those countries because we have less of it <laughs> in that respect at least um i think there's some stuff to learn there if nothing else you know the systems by which you could um maintain a strong social welfare system would still be necessary in a uh you know uh, mm -hmm. um 
uh, uh, market uh, socialism, right? I mean, you'd still have to, you yeah. you would yeah you would still have to know how to properly distribute that wealth and tax and what have you. So, yeah. What if every company was owned by a social wealth fund? So th so the idea would be that capital is ultimately owned by the government, but operationally businesses are private. Would this be a socialist system? Um, I don't think so because of the, uh, the power those groups could leverage. Even if they're owned monetarily by the government, if you're not democratically electing people within those corporations, the person at the top still has leverage they can use to beckon uh, government benefits. They wouldn't be a bourgeois mm -hmm. in the Marxian sense, but you know, if, if you have control over like you know a uh, norwegian oil company um even and it's not a democratically elected fashion you could go to the government you know appropriately leverage your wealth and power to procure benefits for yourself whereas if it's a democratically elected system you could still do so uh, uh you know not as as an owner um but as a democratically elected representative but you would do so alone singly as a representative of your own mm -hmm. institution rather than as a member of a, of a controlling uh, undemocratically, you know, uh, managed firm. Sorry, I'm rambling really so hard because I got like no sleep. I apologize. My my brain is faltering. <laughs> okay. So it's it's not it's it's not enough to democratize capital um, or the government. You it really is. You 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 have under your system. You have to democratize the individual workplaces um, as a as a prerequisite uh, for your system to be considered socialist. I don't think anyone should be able to have any kind of meaningful power without them being able to be voted out if people underneath them get angry. Right. Well, yeah, it sounds. Well, yeah, that's. That sounds like you agree with with uh, with what I said. Um, yeah, yeah, makes, I, uh, yeah. I agree. I agree with the statement that you just levied. Yes, I feel the. I feel the democracy is a, is a necessary characteristic. You know. Um, because I can imagine, for example, in in noted economic text 1984. You know. Um, Technically, the firms people work out there aren't privately owned by anyone, right? I mean, there are a great many, they wouldn't call them businesses, I suppose, the institutions that they work at uh, for, the, for the middle party, or what's it called, the lower party? What is the lesser party? Uh, the, whatever Winston worked for. Anyway, nobody owns it, of course, but people are still in charge of those systems. And you can maintain, in the worst scenario, you know, a kind of bourgeois um, by implication, which is what the Soviet Union had, right? Technically, nobody owned those factories, but party members managed them and the only people who can vote in party members for that management position are other party members. So, you know, mm -hmm. it might as well be a shareholder board. Are you still an anarchist? Like or, did, or have you like, kind of... I'd like to think I am. The term just gets people angry at me, though, so I usually just go by libertarian oh. socialist. <laughs> okay, I got you. No, I... I uh... I've, uh, I, I was, I was, you haven't talked about, uh, that in a while. Um, and, uh, I've been, I've, I've been campaigning to try and get a talk with, uh, Zoe Baker, not, not necessarily a debate, but I think, um, I would really just, uh, she seems like a, quite a, quite a well-read anarchist, whereas a lot of anarchists seem to, it's kind of that anarchism is when there's no bedtime kind of thing. And I think, <laughs> yeah. you know, that Zo Zoe probably, Baker. probably not is remarkably yeah, well-read. I was just saying, yeah, Zoe Baker's remarkably well-read. Certainly smarter than I am. I, I, would, I would watch any conversation that you had with her. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to make it happen. She's, she's just recently finished a PhD, so I, 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 I can't blame her if she uh, just wants to uh, wind down a little bit. Obviously, that's quite a, a difficult thing to do. Um, it's been a busy but, few months, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, all right. I mean, all right, Vash. It was good talking to you. I don't have anything else. Like I said, um, uh, you know, I think we agree on many, uh, most most every prescription besides the the most, uh, uh, so you could say, aggressive ones uh, on, on on your part. Right, but, right. It, um, it's the ideological divide is always going to be the big uh, truncation there at the end. I think with a principled opposition yeah. to the, the bourgeois. But no, well, I, I really appreciate as, the conversation. Thank you for coming on. I, I was gonna. Well, you're you're welcome. As as Lonerbox once said, a wise man, uh, liberals were tragically born without imaginations. So uh, my my liberal sensibilities <laughs> prevent me from uh, from advocating for such a, a a structural change. But uh, but no, it was fun coming on. Like I said to the audience, um, if you're interested in economic discussions like these, uh, you can subscribe to uh, you know my channel, Econoboy, on YouTube. Um, and it was a good uh, a good round two, Vosh. Let's uh, let's hope we can find something for round three one of these days yeah we'll debate um 
Hmm. That would be a good thing. Did you like the new Matrix movie? Um, well, I actually, I thought it was better than most, uh, but it wasn't, uh, I mean, it was just okay. You know, it wasn't a disaster or anything, but it wasn't, people were expecting a lot out of it. I haven't seen it. I'll construct my opinions to be the opposite of yours, and we'll battle over that. Well, I, I do have to warn you, um, well, you know, no, you know, never mind. No, no preconceived notions. Just go in blind on it. It's on HBO Max. Uh, I thought it was okay. I'd give it a 5 out of 10. If I had to recommend a, an absolutely banger of a TV show, um, it is going to have to be Mr. Inbetween on Hulu. I'm sure you've got a Hulu account. Best TV show no one's talking about or gives a shit about. Really, really good show, though. Um, uh, oh, goodness. Um, I, I have one more thing. Uh, do you play Civilization? I played Civ 4 for a long time when I was younger. The only Civ game I ever liked. Well, if you are interested, um, a content creator by the name of Taftaj is uh, trying to organize a civilization content creator showdown of which I am uh, a part. And she and I are pretty fucking good at civilization, Vosh. Which, so which don't want to... Civ 5, not 4, but you know, same thing. Gotcha. Civ 5 was god-awful at release, um, but I hear they fixed it up a bunch <laughs> afterwards, so... Um, well, I'll be sure to take a look. I, I look forward to the degenerate one unit per tile rule, uh, encouraging good and interesting gameplay. Hell yeah. All right, bud. Talk to you later. It was a good talk. Have a wonderful day. Night. Whatever. You too. Bye.